Did the virgin birth actually take place? We're doing a Christmas-themed debate tonight, and we've got actually four debaters, two Christians, two atheists, talking about the virgin birth and a whole range of different topics that are related to this subject. This is the first time we've actually addressed this topic, the virgin birth, on this channel. Uh, and we're doing it in a debate form because uh, we are just a few days now from Christmas. But let's jump in as quickly as possible. I'll give you guys a quick outline of like what you can expect from the debate. We're actually splitting this into two different chunks or different portions. So we'll have one hour just on the broad topic of the virgin birth. Jimmy Aiken will be presenting. We'll get a response from John Loftus. He's our atheist or one of our atheist uh, contributors or debaters. Uh, that, that'll be the first hour, just on the virgin birth. Second hour is going to be focused on uh, these sort of Marian miracles and whether or not we can actually infer from these, say, uh, Marian apparitions or miracles attributed to Mary, whether or not those can actually be used to support the these sort of, you know, the, the ancient documents about the virgin birth and whether or not that actually occurred. And that's a, that part of the debate actually is going to be really interesting. I'm, I'm really excited about that part. We've got Caleb Jackson, who is our Christian. He'll be presenting on that. And then we've got Dr. Darren Slade. He's the uh, atheist historian who's going to be rebutting Caleb's case. So we've got these, uh, this debate is cut up into kind of like two hour sections. Let me go ahead and pull them up on the screen here. So we've got Jimmy Aiken right below me. Caleb is right next to him. John Loftus is next to Caleb. And then Dr. Darren Slade, he is all the way over there in the corner. Um, but instead of like what we kind of do here is we'd like to jump in directly to the material. So if you'd like to learn more about my guests, then check the description. If you hear anything that you like and you'd like to look more into what they're doing and where you can find them, then just check for the description of the video. So with that, let's go ahead and jump as quickly as we can into the presentations. As I mentioned, we've got Jimmy. He'll be sort of opening things up. 10 minute presentation from him, 10 minute rebuttal from John, and then we'll switch it over to the uh, the second hour. Oh, I should have also mentioned that after these opening presentations that we've got for these uh, two hour blocks, we're going to enter into a 40 minute discussion period that'll be open to all four participants. So tonight's actually going to be really interesting. This is kind of a new format and we don't really have a whole lot of like four person debates we host on this channel just because they can kind of get chaotic. But I thought, you know what, to uh, to add to this sort of chaos that's inevitably going to happen tonight. I thought, you know what would be fun? If we actually took the super chats that you guys send in, if we took them and like stopped what they were saying and talking about and, uh, and, and tried to work those in as best as we can. So we'll see what we can do. Uh, I can't promise, you know, that we're going to just actually stop what they're talking about and, and address all of these super chats that will be sent in. But we are going to try to work those in. So if you'd like to help support the ministry and, and ask a question tonight, then uh, you're definitely welcome to do so. And we'll, we'll do our best to, to work that in. So let's kick it over to Jimmy. Let's let him give his 10 minute opening presentation on the virgin birth. Um, let me go ahead and switch scenes here. We'll get his presentation pulled up there we go and so jimmy whenever you're ready i'll uh, i'll be keeping time on my end and uh just let me know when you'd like me to proceed to the next slide sounds great let's start by doing just that and go to the next slide so my understanding is that the original topic of this uh, debate was supposed to be miracles but john insisted that we debate one specific miracle the virgin birth of christ since it's christmas and i understand that um, however, I don't think that this is a particularly well-framed debate topic for us. And, you know, I would have preferred to debate something else, but here we are. Well-framed debates are ones where the participants share a common framework, but then differ on a particular point which they can debate. You know, for example, it would not be a well-framed debate to discuss whether atoms contain subatomic particles known as neutrons, if one of the participants doesn't even believe that atoms exist because he rejects the atomic theory of matter. You know, that would tend to get off track into another topic rather quickly. Uh, debates that aren't well framed tend to divert to other topics, you know, like debating the existence of atoms instead of the existence of neutrons, which is not the same thing. Um, the virgin birth isn't well framed for us because what you conclude about the virgin birth depends on the framework that you have. If you're an Orthodox Christian, like I am, and you see that the New Testament teaches the virgin birth, then you're likely to conclude that it actually mm -hmm. happened. But if you're an atheist, like John, and you see the same thing, the New Testament teaching the virgin birth, you're not likely 
to conclude that it happened. So the virgin birth really doesn't stand on its own apart from other larger issues. And so this debate is likely to veer into other topics besides the virgin birth itself. Nevertheless, what I'll do is present an argument for the virgin birth, an argument that convinces me that it happened. And I'll warn you right now, this is a theological argument because of course it is. You know, it's it, it, this miracle is not one we have tons of independent records of. And so the, um, the miracle that I've been asked to debate is one that is supported principally by theological concerns. Leave it up to John to identify what topics he'd like to debate. But note, we may end up veering away from the virgin birth itself, which is the stated subject of the debate. Next slide, please. So this is an argument that I find convincing for the virgin birth. It is a theological argument. It has eight premises and seven conclusions, and it goes like this. If God exists, then he's infinitely perfect, and God exists, so God is infinitely perfect. That's just a simple modus ponens inference from the first two premises. If God is infinitely perfect, then he's accurate in what he says. And since we already concluded he's infinitely perfect, that means God is accurate in what he asserts. Premise four, if the New Testament is inspired by God, then God asserts what the New Testament asserts. The New Testament is inspired by God, therefore God asserts what the New Testament asserts. Again, these are all just modus ponens. Well, premise six, it turns out the New Testament asserts the virgin birth. Therefore, God asserts what the New Testament asserts, and the New Testament asserts the virgin birth of Christ. If God asserts what the New Testament asserts, and if the New Testament asserts the virgin birth, then it logically follows God asserts the virgin birth. So I conclude, God asserts the virgin birth. And therefore, since God is accurate in what he asserts, and God is accurate in what he asserts, and he also asserts the virgin birth. Finally, for the sake of logical form, if God is accurate in what he asserts, and God asserts the virgin birth, then the virgin birth is going to be true. And since God is, is accurate and asserts the virgin birth, that means the virgin birth is true. Next slide, please. So um, the argument, I, in order to put it in proper logical form so you could see the logical structure, I had to phrase it in kind of a somewhat complicated way just to make sure all the logical steps were spelled out. But the argument uses only two logical operations, conjunction, where you connect two things that have already been established, and modus ponens. Both of those are recognized as valid logical operations. So the argument is logically valid. And the conclusion of a logically valid argument is true if the premises are true. Therefore, to defeat the argument that I've made, John must show that one or more of the premises in the argument is false. Next slide, please. So to make it easy, here are the premises. To prove my argument false, John could uh, show us that if God exists, he wouldn't be infinitely perfect. He could show us that God doesn't exist. He could show that uh, if God is infinitely perfect, he could still be inaccurate in what he says, he, in what he asserts. That's different than just saying. Um, he could show us that if the New Testament is inspired by God, that doesn't mean God asserts what the New Testament asserts. He could show us that the New Testament is not inspired by God. He could show us that the New Testament doesn't assert the virgin birth. Or he could, uh, he could show us one of the last two premises, though they're rather straightforward, even though they're rather complex in how they're phrased. My guess is he'd be better going for one of the first six, but he's welcome to go for any of the eight premises. But he needs to show that one or more of the premises is false in order to disprove an otherwise logically valid argument. So next slide, please. John, it's over to you. Which of my premises do you want to attack? All right, we've got a couple minutes to spare even. So uh, so great job, Jimmy. Let's go ahead and, uh, and toss it over to, uh, to John. I'll go ahead and pull up your presentation, John. 
here we go. And uh, again, just kind of let me know to you know progress through the slides. I'll go ahead and start my timer whenever you begin speaking. Okay, thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm gonna use up all my time, I'm pretty sure. Next slide. Uh, this debate is between Bible-believing Christians and everyone else who doesn't believe a virgin gave birth to an incarnate deity, liberals, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, spiritualists, deists, agnostics, and atheists. In other words, it's them against all others. Next. William Lane Craig merely presupposed the virgin birth. Here's what he said about it. The virgin birth was a stumbling block to my coming to faith. I simply could not believe such a thing, but when I reflected on the fact that God had created the entire universe, it occurred to me that it would not be too difficult for him to make a woman pregnant. Him is capitalized. Who else would have done such a thing? Not Allah, not Shiva, not Vishnu. The question is not whether a God could make a woman pregnant or do any of the other miracles in the Bible, but whether a God did in fact do so. Craig cannot assume that God believed to have done them, did them. Now many clergy don't believe the virgin birth was a biological miracle in the 1998 survey 60% of the Methodist clergy didn't believe it. 44% of the Episcopalians, 49% Presbyterians, 34% American Baptists, 19% American Lutherans, 25% Catholic priests in the UK, and 37% of the Church of England. Next. Uh, they, they didn't believe it. Uh, so there's something here that um, we need to consider. I like comedian Bill Burr. He said, everyone else's religion sounds stupid. The first time I heard the story of Scientology, I thought that it is the dumbest stuff I've ever heard in my life without, while simultaneously believing that a woman who had never had sex, had a baby and had walked on the water, died and came back three days later. Yeah, that made total sense to me, he says. So it just hit me one day. Why doesn't Scientology make sense? And my stuff does. It's because I heard their story when I was an adult. I heard my story when I was four years old. Peter Boghossian says it well. Given the amount of religions in the world, we are forced to conclude that a tremendous number of people are delusional. There's no other conclusion one can draw. The most terrible thing we can say about faith is that it's likely to be false. And he adds, belief in God is not the problem. Belief without evidence is a problem. Warrantless, dogged confidence is the problem. Epistemological arrogance masquerading as humility is the problem. Faith is the problem. Next. Did Dr. Craig follow the evidence? No, not when it came to the virgin birth. In fact, to this day, Craig has never argued the evidence supports the virgin birth. Solid evidence is required. It gets us to the truth. It alone will help us avoid scams, conspiracies, paranormal beliefs, religions, and delusions of all kinds. We know this. Testimony to be considered eyewitness testimony is only as good as the weight of solid evidence that backs it up. What does not count as solid evidence is circumstantial evidence, subjective feelings, writings claimed to be inspired, dreams or alleged visions, third, second, third, fourth hand hearsay testimony, and a one in a million healing event. Now about the one in a million healing, we know the odds are one in a million, but there are eight billion people on the planet. So you'd actually expect a lot of um, uh, unexplainable um, healing events. Yes, but this is all Christian believers have. Again, they cannot say the God of the Bible did that. Now let's turn to Mar Mary's virginity. Where is the solid evidence Mary was a virgin? We hear nothing about her wearing a chastity belt to prove her virginity. No one checked for an intact hymen before she gave birth either. Where is the evidence that neither Joseph nor any other man was not the father? Maury Porvich was not there with a DNA test to verify Joseph was not the baby daddy, nor did he test others to see if they were. We don't even have firsthand testimonial evidence for the virgin of birth. The best all we have is a secondhand testimony allegedly from one person, Mary. Joseph was convinced Mary was a virgin because of a dream. In chapter one of Matthew, he says, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of God, or son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. And then when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Thomas Hobbes, English philosopher, said this. For a man to say God hath spoken to him in a dream is no more than to say he dreamed that God spoke to him, which is not a force to win belief from anyone. We cannot independently cross-examine Mary or Joseph for credibility and consistency, along with the people who knew them. We would need to do this since they may have a very good reason for lying, like pregnancy out of wedlock. Now let's turn to some other uh, fake things that uh, we need to consider, the genealogies. And Jacob begot Joseph. Jo Joseph, and the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ in Matthew, and now in Luke. Now, Jesus himself, about 30 years old, when he began his ministry, he was the son, so it was thought, 
of Joseph. In no other case is an adopted son a legitimate heir to the throne. You see, wars over such things. Either Joseph was the biological father of Jesus or he was not. If he was not, then Jesus was not a gene-carrying descendant of David, and God's fulfilled promise to David was not fulfilled. Uh, did the genealogies trace to Mary? With only double X chromosomes, she alone could only give birth to girls. By contrast, the ancients believed a mother that mothers provided but a mere incubating tube in which the father's seed became a child. So the male child could be nothing less than a creation miracle out of nothing, making the genealogies irrelevant. Now let's turn to the fake star of Bethlehem. Matthew's gospel says, the star which the Magi had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. Now I've seen all kinds of uh, attempts to find this star, meteor, comet, constellation of planets, supernova, or the type 1C hypernova located in the uh, closest galaxy to ours, Andromeda. The fatal problem is that the magical star led the Magi to Bethlehem and stopped in the sky directly over a specific house where Jesus was born. Not only are moving stars nonsense, they don't appear to move in a southern direction from Jerusalem south to Bethlehem. Stars appear to move from the east to the west like the sun because of the spin of the earth. Here's a map. In the middle you see Jerusalem. You have to go south to, to Bethlehem. The stars had to have traveled south, but that's nonsense. Now the fake census. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So it says, Joseph went to Bethlehem for the census, because he was from the lineage of David, it says. David lived 42 generations, and we trust one of the genealogies, but if everyone returned to an ancestor's town 42 generations ago, the whole empire would be uprooted. If this was the only, was only required for King David's lineage, then what was Augustus Caesar thinking when he ordered it? He had a king, Herod. To sum up so far, if we wish to see Luke's accounts as historical events, we'd have to take a large leap of faith. We'd have to assume that while on verifiable matters of historical fact, Luke tells all sorts of fairy tales but on supernatural matters, which by definition cannot be checked, he reports the facts. Now but into the last part, the, the fake prophecy of Isaiah. In the days of King Ahaz, the Lord said to Isaiah, this is a quote from Isaiah, Go forth to meet Ahaz and say to him, Take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint, because Syria and Ephraim has this devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and let us conquer it. Thus saith the Lord God, within 65 years, Ephraim will be broken to pieces so that it will no longer be a people. And continuing, then the Lord spoke to Ahaz, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a maiden, that's a maiden, Allah, not Betula, two minutes. which is, uh, how much? What? Uh, two minutes, sorry. Okay. All right. Behold, a maiden uh, shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call him his name Emmanuel. Before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before those two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Robert Miller. End of his book, Born Divine. The imminent birth of the baby is the point. The birth is coming soon enough to be a sign for King Ahaz that God will protect the throne of David during the current military crisis. The birth of which Isaiah speaks can be a sign for Ahaz only if it is imminent. Isaiah could not possibly have intended to predict the birth of Jesus for the obvious reason that the birth over 700 years in Isaiah's future could not be assigned to Ahaz. Again, even if we take the Greek translation Parthenos in Matthew, it's a mistranslation. To refer to virgin, it only means that a woman who is now vir a virgin will become pregnant. No miracle is intended. Every woman who gets pregnant was once a virgin. In both the Hebrew and the Greek, the divine sign is the timing of the conception, not its manner. John Dominic Crossan tells us what really happened. Clearly, someone went seeking in the Old Testament for a text that could be interpreted as prophesying, prophesying the virginal conception, even if such a, was never the original me meaning. All right. Well, uh, you were under time. Actually, I think you had about 35 seconds remaining. But yeah, so at this point, we're... yeah, if you'd like, you have another 30 seconds. It's up to you. No, that's fine. Thank you. OK, well, um, so at this point, we're going to switch to a 40 minute period where this is just going to be an open dialogue between the four guests tonight. So let's just open it up. Um, Jimmy, I mean, 
we can turn it over to you or Caleb, actually. I mean, because um, this is open to all four of you guys. It it, it really depends. I mean, it's I'm I'm just gonna kind of let you guys do your thing. I'll jump in if I need to. I, I, we were before we went live. I was I was letting them know like I'd like to stay out of this as much as possible. So we're gonna try to prioritize. Uh, what word did I use? I can't remember the word. Uh, just be nice, guys. Just be nice. Well, yeah. I, I Happy can, to I be nice. This, I can ask this question. Uh, uh, if in I, fact, actually, uh, actually, since you've just made your case, I'd like to ask oh, a, a ask question. question. Okay. So, um, John, you've said quite a number of different things. And of course, I have responses to all of the individual things you said. But what I couldn't help noting is that you didn't challenge any of my premises. Now, I, I don't blame you for that because you didn't see my my slides beforehand and I didn't see your slides beforehand. So this is our first attempt at an engagement, but I've laid down a logically valid argument for the virgin birth. So if its premises are true, the conclusion that the virgin birth is true follows from them. And it may be a theological argument, argument, but that does affect its logical validity. So if you want to show that this conclusion that the virgin birth is true is false, you have to attack one of my one or more of my premises. Um, now, uh, Cameron may want to put up the, the premises slide again. There's also a duplicate of it at the last slide in my presentation, just so we can see the premises again. But that's what you need to attack, John. So please tell me which of those you'd like to attack, and then we can discuss them. If not, then you don't disprove my argument. Well, you know, um, your argument is not on target because your argument is none other than what William Lane Craig and others say. You know, you presuppose God, so voila, the virgin birth or a miracle. You're, you're not actually dealing with the evidence that we that I've presented the, the faked things of uh, the genealogy, faked um, prophecy, fake star. Uh, you know, it, 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 these don't matter. These don't. They're, they're not. They're not evidence. I mean, there's you know, no actually, evidence being presented. So I, I have mean. premises, and if you want to attack the premises, I'll give you my evidence for the premises. No, you can. Every argument has to have starting premises because otherwise it becomes an infinite regress. And so these are my starting premises for an argument that convinces me the virgin birth is true. If you want to challenge a premise, then I'll tell you why I believe the premise and we can discuss it. On the other hand, um, merely bringing up tangential material like you assert that the genealogies of Christ are mistaken. Okay, well, that could, be, that could be true, but the virgin birth could still be true, even if the genealogies are mistaken. You said the census was made up. Well, okay, maybe the census was made up, but that doesn't mean the virgin birth didn't happen. You're bringing in tangential issues, and if you want them to have evidential force against my argument, you need to find a way to direct them against one of the premises. Jimmy, the premises, uh, let me go ahead and... Uh, valid. I can attack your first premise. What we have here is what's called a question begging definition, uh, where you are using highly questionable definitions for some of the key terms in your premise, uh, which is the, de your definition of God being something about immeasurably perfect. You are making your premise true by definition. There's nothing that's no, it's not imperfect. Well, Okay, so in the first place, uh, arguments can, now I understand you're a historian, not a philosopher. You said that you didn't want to be called a philosopher. And in yeah, philosophy, that's a, that's an assumption. I am well, so a philosopher, I just didn't okay. want to be referred to as that. Go ahead. That's fine, so am I. I'm also a philosopher. And so we both should know that in philosophy, premises can be true by definition. If I had as one of the premises in my argument, a bachelor is an unmarried man, that would be a perfectly legitimate premise. It's not question begging. Only it's just true by definition. The empirical claim is irrefutable and it is if it is agreed upon. But the problem is you are assuming everybody has the same definition of what it means to be perfect, what it means to be God. Okay. All of that is I'll, disputable. I, I, I recognize I recognize that different people may have different definitions. For example, if you're talking about a lowercase God, like let's say Hephaestus 
or um, Mars, well, gods like Hephaestus and Mars don't have to be infinitely perfect. In fact, I would say none of the Greek gods are infinitely perfect. But as a philosopher, you would know that we can use stipulative definitions. And so when I use the word God, I stipulate that God is infinitely perfect. Anything else is not, it may be a maybe a God in someone's sense, but it's not the kind of God I'm talking about. And that is in fact the problem. You are assuming the truth of your definitions and your no, right you're there. Mis- in the you're, past. You're, you're mistaken. It, if I say a, a bachelor is an unmarried man, John is an unmarried man, therefore John is a bachelor. I am assuming what the word bachelor means, but that's not a problem. I'm just stipulating it. If someone else doesn't use the word bachelor to mean an unmarried man, then they're not engaging my argument. And in well, the same you know, way, you're, you're, is your not, problem, no, what you did there is not follow some Oxford Webster's definition there. Like, Yours is a lot more nebulous. Uh, it would be more akin to saying, uh, since true love is defined as a love that never ends in divorce, therefore, people who got divorced are never were never in love or never had true love. The concept of true love is what is debatable there. You have superimposed your own assumed to be true but debatable definition on several key terms. And it doesn't fly. It doesn't fly in academia. It doesn't fly in philosophy. You're mistaken. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy before you come back, it looks like John wanted to, to say something. So let's get his thoughts and yeah. then we'll, we'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. Uh, my, my argument, uh, Jimmy, is uh, something you didn't, you didn't address. I mean, uh, I'm arguing that there's no evidence, even if you believe in God, that... Uh, the, the, that you should believe the uh, the virgin birth. I mean, there are clergy who do not believe it was a biological uh, miracle, and uh, they apparently believe in a perfect God. So, so you have to get down and dirty with the evidence, and this evidence is supposed to lead people to believe that we can trust that evidence, the evidence that is in, um, you know, Matthew and, and Luke. By the way, Mark never mentioned the virgin birth, and neither did Paul. But um, uh, actually, I would dispute both of those claims. But fine, go ahead. Fine, fine, fine. Um, so, so what I'm what I'm calling into question is basically more than you understand, because I, I only had ten minutes. But um, I'm I'm asked I'm saying that Matthew and Luke are terribly bad at uh, interpreting the Bible, uh, the, the Old Testament uh, uh, texts, uh, the stars in the sky, uh, ge- what genealogies do or don't mean. And so um, I'm saying this: if you can't believe Matthew and Luke in the, in the version of birth story, then everything in them is um, is a qu- a questionable. Every Everything in Luke and in Matthew is including the resurrection of the dead. I'm sure I'm pretty sure you're going to say, well, no, I believe in the version because if Jesus was risen from the dead, therefore uh, he could he could have been virgin, virgin born. But I'm saying the texts are so bad. In fact, I think the uh, virgin texts in the, the in the gospels are actually they undercut the gospels themselves and uh, because after noticing that joseph was convinced by a dream and knowing that paul has all kinds of visions he's led around by them and uh he, you know, he, and and things we have no we have n- no reason to uh, to believe anything in the gospels without solid objective evidence since Okay, so, you've, you've re- so, John, you've reiterated a number of the points that you made in your opening presentation. Um, I'm afraid, uh, uh, Darren, that I, I'm going to have to, John's just brought a new bunch of material on the table, so I won't be able, unless you want to bring it up again, I won't be able to continue our discussion about stipulative definitions, but they are commonly used in academia. This, what you said about them not being used in academia is simply false. No, Having you said didn't that, use it correctly. That's I, the problem. I, I, I used I used it correctly. And if you want to ask questions about what do I mean no, when I say I God or what do I mean when I say you infinitely perfect, you you're welcome to do that. And just saying I didn't do it yeah, doesn't have to I haven't committed a fallacy. You haven't named a fallacy. Furthermore, in begging I, definition, you committed it. I have I haven't I have not done that. But um, I need to get to John's point. 
Now, John has raised a bunch of different points that he seems to be mounting a kind of cumulative case argument against the virgin birth. He's citing different kinds of evidence from different domains. None of the things that he cited actually engaged the virgin birth directly. A genealogy doesn't do that. A star doesn't do that. An Old Testament prophecy doesn't do that. None of those things directly engage the virgin birth. He says that I need to engage the evidence. And actually, I'm doing that. But what he needs to realize is the perspective I'm coming from does not depend on what Mary said. It does not depend on what Matthew said. It does not depend on what Luke said. I'm not relying on the authority of Mary or Matthew or Luke or Mark or Paul. I'm relying on the authority of God. I trust God more than I trust any of the other people I just named. So if God asserts the virgin birth is true, I'm going to believe God. That's why I believe it, not because I've got some mountain of historical evidence I could independently investigate. John was attacking your premise three. Hang, hang on. Well, you're John John to say that. I'm right. trying to get to the John end of this. John was sentence. addressing premise number three, and you I'm, don't seem to understand that. Cameron, I'm going to Cameron, I'm going to need you to intervene because I need an adjudication on time. I let John go on for quite some time. I've let Darren go on yeah. for quite some time. I'm trying to, to get to a conclusion and throw it back over to them. Darren, but yeah, Darren, let's about- let's let him just finish his point here, and then we'll bring you back in for sure to let you make your points. Okay, so uh, you know, John has tried to mount a cumulative case argument, but I've provided a valid argument for the virgin birth. One or more of those premises has to be false. So what I've done is provide a logical structure that we can use to build on. So I would invite John to relate your arguments to one of my premises and try to show that it's false. Well, where's, where's the premise that says that uh, you can trust the Bible, you can trust uh, uh, the evidence that's presented? You have to have evidence. I mean, that was my main point. You have to have evidence. And everything we know from Matthew and Luke is that they're clueless. They're absolutely clueless uh, about yeah, prophecies, I would dispute that, but... about the, about the, uh, you know, the stars. Well, if I can just say to Darren was saying that John was objecting to basically premise three and maybe premises four and five. If he's attack if he's doing an internal critique on the genealogies and just the overall historicity of the account, he's saying if we can poke holes in the story, does that not make us question the accuracy of the New Testament, which makes us question the inspiration by God and so right? That's what Darren and John were trying to to get at just to to kind of direct this more towards the premises. If that's yeah, an accurate it, it, it sounds to, it sounds to me like they're they're that John is mostly going for premise five that the New Testament is inspired by God and he's trying to use various things that he sees as flaws in the Gospels as evidence against the inspiration of the New Testament. Um, Darren, you seem to still think that he's going uh, contrary to three. Three is if God is infinitely perfect, then he's accurate in what he asserts. So well, it seems like. You don't to deny that definitions. What do you mean by he is accurate in what he asserts? What does that mean? I mean that God, that if God asserts something, that thing is accurate. It is true. And um, an what assertion, sense? what's that? In what sense true? It corresponds with reality. Standard correspondence definition of truth. Epistemology okay. 101. Okay. So, as a philosopher, you should know that truth and those types of words have a whole bunch of complex layers to it. So, there is no standardized definition that all of a sudden we should be buying into. But you're saying, are you saying from premise number three, God inspired the birth narrative in Matthew and Luke, therefore it is historically true? metaphorically true, allegorically true, spiritually true, which one? So premise three doesn't actually address the birth narratives. Um, when I get uh, to to something dealing with the virgin birth. When you say it's, God it's, communicates accurately. Sorry, Darren, let, let's see if we can, let's see if we can get Jimmy's, Jimmy's yeah, response because, before we, yeah. No, let's, I'm not let Jimmy try to dominate by picking a different things in semantics. You know exactly what I'm asking. When God asserted 
in the New Testament is that historically true, symbolically true, spiritually true? What is the answer? It's a pretty quick well, Darren, answer. Darren, before, yeah, let, let's let him actually give his response though here. So when an assertion is made, it can take different forms like a symbol, an allegory, a metaphor, or a historical truth. Um, I would assert, if we want to refine a premise, that the New Testament asserts the virgin birth as a historical fact, and therefore God asserts the virgin birth as a historical fact, and though I, and thus I conclude that, that the virgin birth is true as a historical fact. So what That's, you're saying I is thought what we were here to debate asserted as accurate your interpretation because he doesn't say in the New Testament this is an historical fact. That's your interpretation. You assume it's an historical truth being communicated as opposed to an allegorical one. So uh, in other I, words, what you I need don't... to do is change number three to say if God is infinitely perfect, then he has concluded my interpretation is correct. No, that's not how I need to readjust it. That would invalidate the form of the argument. I can tweak the premises, but I'm operating in a framework that assumes we are all here trying to arrive at truth and not simply trying to play word games. Um, we're here to debate the virgin birth, meaning is it true? And I assume all four of us are concerned with whether it's historically true, not symbolically true or metaphorically true. That's not what we're yes. here to debate. Yes. So yes. you can show the goodwill. You, of, you can, the you can show, you can show goodwill in two true. ways. Number one, by not talking uh, over me while I'm still speaking. And yeah. number two, by assuming common sense meanings for words, based on the format of the debate we're in. Yeah. But okay, before gonna, before we move on, before we move on, Darren, 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 before we move on, I am going to have to start muting people. And I don't I this is very unusual actually for for my channel to have to mute people. Uh but but I mean part of that is just that we've got a lot of people like here with us tonight, so we we may have to just do that. But I'm just letting you know, I am about to start doing that if if we can't be polite and let people talk. So, uh, okay, uh let's continue. My point, my point is that it requires evidence, mm -hmm. and uh, all they have is uh, one person who said, uh, "My birth is a is a virgin birth," uh, by hearsay testimony, and uh, there's no, there's nothing to support that evidence in the genealogies, the prophecies, the star, you, you know, um, and um, and and just you want to believe it? Okay, go ahead, but just be honest with me right now you say, well, there's no objective evidence for it, even though I, I should have objective evidence for it. Just go ahead. I mean, you can't say that um, uh, I can just believe what the Bible says because the Bible says that God must have been inspired to, and you know, to say these sorts of things. Uh, and uh, therefore, even though it makes no sense, I mean, it's utter, utterly nonsensical, um, I'm still going to believe it. You can do that if you want. Okay, you put several things on the table there. I'm not sure I'll be able to remember them all without you reminding me, but um, I, 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 you asked to debate a particular miracle that we have evidence for in the form of the New Testament. I do not assume the New Testament is true just because. I don't assume the New Testament is true. I'm a Christian apologist. I, ha I think I have evidence that God exists, and evidence that God inspired the Bible, and evidence that it's consequently true in what it asserts. Now, you have accused me of not having evidence and just assuming this, but actually I'm not assuming it. I've indicated, here are my premises, you're welcome to attack whatever one you want, and then we can talk about the evidence for that premise. Thus far, you, John, haven't identified such a premise, but I would invite you to do so, or at least relate your your arguments to one of my premises so we can have a basis for interaction. Yeah, I really I really want to circumvent your taking charge of these, uh, this debate by certain premises. I've repeatedly said, I've uh, argue that it needs evidence, it doesn't have it, and that's my argument. You can go ahead and continue believing it in if you want because it's in the Bible, but that's that's what faith does, and faith also is what you need to 
uh, Jetson, if you want to know the truth. It's not circumstantial evidence. It's not second, third, fourth hand hearsay testimony. It's not any of that. It's looking at the evidence and saying, hmm, okay, I, I don't see it. Well, um, so I, you know, I want to be respectful of you. And if you don't want to engage an argument that I've made, then you're free not to engage the argument I've made. However, I would Likewise. also say you Likewise. therefore, you therefore have not disproven the argument that I've made. Likewise. Likewise. Because oh, the bottom line is evidence. I mean, that's, that's just, would you repeat after me? That no, evidence I will. Matters? Evidence matters, and I've got tons of evidence, but you're not asking about it. I, why don't you dispute something I said for once? I mean, come well, on. Well, I'm happy okay. to do that. I'm happy to okay. do that. That'll start, take start us start. off. That'll take us start, off start. the subject. Okay. I'm happy to dispute something you said. It'll take us off the subject of the virgin birth and onto a, onto a, a adjacent matter, but, but I'm happy to do that. For example, um, you said that, um, Let's see. Do we? I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Do you want me to dispute what you said about the star, or sure. about the census, or what would you prefer? Sure. You can pick your your best target if you okay. want. Okay. Well, I don't have a best target. I have. I have, there are several. It's just a question of of uh, which one to do in this case. Let's take the star because okay. you said stars don't that there's nothing that corresponds to what the star of bethlehem might have been and that it led the uh uh the magi to bethlehem and that that's impossible that we don't have moving stars because they orbit in the sky from east to west okay no i didn't, well, I, didn't say, I didn't say it was impossible see god can do anything if he exists i'm saying there's no evidence for it he may have done that he did he, there's no evidence for it I mean, it's it's nonsensical to well, assume. I, I would those... okay. Then I would assume. Uh, then I would say that we don't need evidence for this because that's not what happened. The, you, the star, the star, was in fact, according to our best evidence, the planet Jupiter, and the planet Jupiter had special significance in Babylonian astrology, um, based on the omen-based system of astrology used in Babylon. When Judah, when J Jupiter did certain things, it signified that a king was going to be born in Amuru, which was the Babylonian name for the West between Babylon and the Mediterranean Sea. And um, the only kingdom in that area was, uh, what, the only substantial kingdom in that area was Israel. And so consequently, when Babylonian Magi saw Jupiter do something in the sky in 3 BC that indicated that a king was going to come from Amuru and knock over the Babylonian dynasty. They concluded we need to establish uh, some kind of mission to this new king who can help liberate us from the Persians. So we have evidence from Babylonian astrology, specifically from their astrological texts, that indicate that some of the things that Jupiter did in 3 BC and 2 BC would signal the need to have a friendship mission to the newborn Jewish king. They therefore went to Jerusalem, which is the place Jewish kings lived, and said, so where is he? Where's the newborn king? They had to be told to go to Bethlehem. They were not following the star. They then set out to Bethlehem, which is six miles south of Jerusalem, and it's slightly to the west of Jerusalem, so the road turns to the west. As they're going, they see Jupiter in front of them in the sky, and they rejoice because that was a providential coincidence. They didn't know they were going to see Jupiter, but they see Jupiter in the sky. Because the sky rotates to the west at 15 degrees per hour, and it's about a two-hour trip to Bethlehem from Jerusalem on foot, J Jupiter would have moved 30 degrees from east to west in the sky in front of them as the road is turning to the west. So Jupiter would appear in front of them and stay in front of them as they went because the road is turning to the west, Jupiter is moving to the west. When they get there, they look up above the house, they see Jupiter and interpret it as a providential sign. There's nothing impossible about this. There's nothing scientifically improbable about this. This is all the normal natural movements of Jupiter as understood when you have the correct background from Babylonian astrology and when you read the text of Matthew in a careful way. So I would dispute what you said about the star. Hey, Jimmy, you real quick, uh, I'm trying to 
read my Bible, where, uh, what verse in the Bible is it in Matthew that says Jupiter? Uh, it which doesn't. One is it, says, it says oh. a, a star. Is, it, is that what and, you mean by and, creative? And, and we have, have been Bible? able... And we have been able to plausibly identify the star based on archaeology that has revealed to us what Babylonians believed. So when it says, so it doesn't say Jupiter. It does it say 30 degree rotation. It doesn't have to say any of that. Jimmy, it Jimmy say, this is, it just, this is it, an archaeologically plausible star reconstruction. Stopped over a house. They had, uh, they had a it word for planet. over the house. It was over the it, house. They had a word for planets. That's where we get our English word. We get that's how we got our English word planets because it comes from a, a Greek word of the same origin. Uh, they use star, and then and as astrologers, they know the difference between a star and a planet. And, but yet you you what you want to say? I'll need to address that. I'll need to address that. Would well, you like me to address well, it now or in a moment? Well, I just want to say. I mean, like you. you uh, why don't you just say this? It was a miraculous star. Uh, there's no evidence for it now, and uh, you can uh, conjecture a planet in the place of a star if you want to try to make it fit. But how do you get that to actually move uh, and lead the Magi? Magi, by the way, Babylonians. You're assuming they knew about Jewish prophecy and the, and the Messiah. No, you're not. assuming the can. There's no, no record not. of that. There's no record of the Magi ever doing that except in the New Testament. So it's, uh, it yeah. looks contrived. Why don't you just say? Is a miraculous star and be done with it and say, I believe anyway. It's a miraculous the, star. That's what, that's what the, they, okay, you've asked me a set of questions and I'll be happy to answer them. I don't believe it was is, was a miraculous star. I don't believe it was leading them. The text does not say that it was that it was leading it them or that it, no, it doesn't. It says it was in front of them and Jupiter would have been in front of them on the trip to Bethlehem. Um, so I don't believe it was a miraculous star and it's identified based on Babylonian astrology. We have the cuneiform texts. They've been translated. I have $300 volumes from Real Academic Publishing that contain the texts. This is, um, this, it, I've they, read not, I, hang, hang on. I'm not saying that, the, that they knew anything about a Jewish Messiah. When they arrive, they don't use the word Messiah. They say, where is he who has been born King of the Jews? They're expecting a king from this kingdom based on their own system of astrology's predictions. So I, I'm just using a reasonable deduction that is not exclusively biblical, um, me, but combines elements, evidence from archaeology. Let me just read the Bible to you again. It says, the star went on before them until it came and stopped over the place where the child was. Yeah, I mean, it did. You, it did those if you, things. If you think, if you think <laughs> that's Jupiter and it's pointing down to a, a house somewhere, a stable or something like that, this is the. That's so we've what it got Jupiter we've got was two, moving and then it stopped. John, don't you know Cuneo? It does. Okay, it, it it doesn't say stopped. You're dealing with a translation issue here. If we actually look at what it says, um, it indicates that the star went before them, and it was it preceded them. Uh, the term that it uses is the term that it uses was uh, proagen, and proagen just means to proceed, and it did proceed in front of them. Jupiter did exactly that until it came and stood. Uh, the word is histemi. Histemi does not mean stop; it means stands. And so, if you approach a house and you see Jupiter is over it, Jupiter is standing over the house because stars don't visibly move in a matter of a couple of minutes. So when you see the house and it's got Jupiter above it, you're saying, wow, Jupiter is standing above this house. It doesn't mean it's stopped in its orbit. It just means it's above the house. Fine, that doesn't change anything. You, you, can't, you can't stop, you can't uh, hover over a house either, but that's okay. I mean, you, you have to say, there's no evidence for what I'm saying, and yet I'm gonna say it anyway. I'm sorry, I don't wanna be rude. But uh, you have this need to believe, and you're trying to fit the text into uh, some kind of a storyline. It's a well, miraculous star. It's meant to be a miraculous star. Okay, so personalizing the argument doesn't really advance it. I can do the same thing and say, well, John, you have a need to disbelieve. And so consequently, you're misreading the text. You're not okay. doing careful study. Personalizing the argument doesn't help us. What I've tried to do is answer the question honestly. You wanted to debate the virgin birth. I explained why I believe it. 
I gave a logically valid argument. If you want to disprove my conclusion that the virgin birth is true as a historical fact, Darren, then you need to disprove one or more of my premises. And I've invited you to do that. You can repeat that all you want, but it makes no sense to me. I'm, I'm calling into well, question. I'm calling into question. you don't understand logic. Oh, I understand logic, and you can make anything uh, follow certain premises and, and avoid the, the, the topic entirely. I'm questioning the reliability of Matthew and Luke's stories, and with that, everything that goes in those stories, in those Gospels, including the resurrection of, of, of Jesus. And so uh, I don't need to come up with a like well, then, an then you, logical thing. I'm just then, saying that's what... Then I would say you should have asked to debate the reliability of the New Testament and not the virgin birth. But you asked to I, debate the virgin birth. I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I the issue is, is a lot of the adding to the biblical story here to make it fit science, modern day science, when none of that would have been necessary in the ancient world because they're going off of a very ancient superstitious worldview. But you're definitely incorrect about interpreting J uh, Matthew 2, 9, about the fact that the star isn't in motion and then stops. But then you said, oh, but you can't see motion with the stars. Yeah, and you can't tell a house based off of Jupiter. Now, I can go outside right now, take a look at Jupiter in the night sky. Guess what I'm not going to be able to do? Pinpoint that to a house. That's Actually, you can. Really? You can You can give an address based off of yeah. looking? At if I'm standing Jupiter. in front of the front door of the house, I can look up and see what star is directly over the house. There will probably be several stars directly over the house that are visible to the naked eye. But if I'm standing close to the house and I look up above it, I could see Jupiter. I could see Venus. I could see I could see one of the stars of Cassiopeia. I could see anything that happens to be above the house at that moment in the sky. Yeah, I, I don't know if I. It's a matter of perspective. I tell you this, but Jupiter's millions of miles away. It's not above anything on Earth. In a relative perspective. Jupiter, like other bodies yeah, in the sky, including the sun, that. appear above things. You can go to a building at noon, look up and see the sun above the building. You can do the same thing with Jupiter. It's just a, it's just a smaller light. By the way, y'all mentioned about how we have this term planet. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the history of astronomy, but historically, the term aster... The term aster referred to any luminous body in the sky. So even the sun and the moon, because they were luminous bodies in the sky, were called planets. But the full name is Asteres Planetes. Planetes is Greek for wanderer. And so what they would do is distinguish the background fixed stars, which maintained relative positions to each other, from the wandering stars like Jupiter. So Jupiter was indeed conceived of as a star. It was a wandering star, an Asteres, comet, uh, an Asteres planetes. So let's let let's let John or uh, or Darren give their last thoughts on this, and then we're going to switch to the second half of the show, which we'll be talking about these sort of uh, Marian apparitions, Marian type miracles, and whether or not that can be used to also support uh, the virgin birth. So, but let's give uh, John and Darren a, a, a last comment here, and then we'll switch. Uh, okay. Well, um, he's uh, Jimmy is trying to make. Like, like what Darren said, he, he's trying to fit uh, a text that was never intended to be scientifically examined uh, into uh, a scientific uh, case. And um, I mean, it's clearly they were pre-scientific. They didn't even know how babies were born. You know, they, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, it's a, all you need is a womb and just plant some seed in it. And the womb is just supposed to be there and bring it to fruition. So uh, you, you ought to, Rethink that and then look at that clergy survey and ask yourself, well, let's see, now why do so many of them, not all, not many, clearly in some of those percentages, uh, there are more believers uh, in the clergy than non-believers, but it, imagine 25% of Catholics in the UK, uh, Catholic clergy, they, they must see the same things I do. And you don't have to be an atheist. I'm saying what you believe 
is clearly against what everyone else, your views go against what everyone else thinks in the world, you know, uh, that said Jews and agnostics, deists, uh, spiritualists, you know, liberals. So um, you need to reconsider the evidence and ask yourself, am I doing to the Bible what the Bible was never meant to do? And, and Bart Ehrman makes those kind of cases. You know, you, you can still believe, you know, I suppose uh, it's just that you have to understand what the Bible says and you're trying to make it scientifically accurate is really wrong, really bad. Uh, Jimmy, well, did you want to respond to that real quick? I'm happy to if Cam would like me to. Uh, sure, yeah, feel free. Yeah, um, so uh, you mentioned that various people don't believe in the virgin birth, including people who are not Christians. Okay, fine. So what? Truth isn't determined by popularity contests. Historically, most people believe the earth was flat until the Greeks discovered it wasn't after studying the matter. Well, most of the people you name, including a lot of the clergy, have never actually studied this matter. I have. I've seen the evidence concerning this, and I have to tell you that the arguments that you've mounted don't address the argument that I've framed, which is logically valid, and mo the individual claims you've made about the genealogies and about the census and about the star actually don't hold up when you do a careful study of them. But I don't want to take time to further dwell on that because I know we need to move on. All right, yeah, Jimmy, let's let's turn. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted me to respond real quick. Uh, Darren, yeah, Phil, let's let's do that, and then we'll move, and yeah, then we'll move to the second section. Yeah, um, you know, Jimmy, at the very beginning, you had said this is not a well framed debate, and I actually disagree mm -hmm. with that because we all have a fair good grounding of what reality is, and virgins don't get pregnant, and we all have not that. Not a miracle. Right. Well, and that's kind of the issue, though. You haven't proven or demonstrated a miracle. You just said that God is accurate in what he says. Uh, then you say that that must be an historical virgin birth, not an allegorical one, metaphorical one, nothing like that. Um, God also, according to one of your positions, uh, inspired the New Testament. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's 2 Thessalonians 2.11. And I can actually list a whole bunch of verses in the Bible where God is lying and deceiving purposely. So God is accurate historically, yet when he chooses to lie also. So even you can say he inspired the New Testament all you want. Doesn't mean that a virgin birth happened. Could potentially mean your God lies. So Jimmy, I'm sure you've got like, you know, 20 different things you'd like to say in response yeah. to that, but, but let, let's move on, uh, to yep. the second section. Let's get a, and Caleb has been quiet like this entire time. So let's, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to turn over to him to, to get his, uh, his presentation. So let me go ahead and pull up that scene here. I was right. being quiet to show off my impression of Jesus during the passion when he was silent like a lamb. So <laughs> trying to draw that analogy. So now you're going to do the blasphemy. <laughs> Yeah, probably not. Do you? Um, yeah, go ahead and share oh, your screen, and then I'll, I'll get it up I here. Shared it up. Okay, got it. Uh, share. All right. Can you see that? There we go. Is yep. it full screen. Yeah, it's on, okay. Yeah, it's on it. the full screen. Yep. So, mine, so. Yeah, and then whenever you, whenever you begin, I'll I'll start my timer. Okay. Yeah, uh, we can just go ahead and go. So. Yeah, I, again, thank you for that interaction. Sorry that I didn't have more to contribute in that one, but I didn't want to, to get off rails. So I'm going to be taking a different approach and one that I feel more comfortable with because I, I think like perhaps some of the atheists that are on the panel today and more sympathetic to knowing that history, I think, has its limitations. And the historical method of all the methods is probably the most presumptive and the most um, unreliable in terms of the guesses and assumptions that we have to make. So I do think that appealing to modern phenomena would be better and we can make a retroactive argument for that. So uh, this is perhaps a bit unorthodox, but I think it, uh, at least in my mind, may be a bit more effective. So essentially, I'm going to be arguing that if we have good evidence for miracles, at least miracles within a particular Marian context for the theming of this uh, occur, and can be inferred to be supernatural is the best explanation, then this gives us justification in believing that um, Mary is perhaps the cause or at least one of the causes of such phenomenon and would lead to belief that perhaps the Christian doctrines of Mary, including the virgin birth, are 
likely true or at least have far more validity than they would on their own. So uh, I think that, uh, and I will say that Darren Slade's article on uh, miracles, which was published in John Loftus's book, is very good. I know he has a couple. Um, one of, one's a chapter in the book and he has another one about uh, psychology. And I honestly don't find that many areas in that published text where I disagree with, with Darren because in, in that, at least in that text, uh, he says that, you know, we need to have a critical methodology for investigating miracles and we don't necessarily need to presuppose that miracles are just impossible a priori. Perhaps they are, perhaps they aren't, but we shouldn't just accept testimony blatantly without some kind of criteria. We need to be very rigorous and we need to be skeptical and do this. Not hyper skeptical, but skeptical enough to where we can rule out other alternative possibilities which we know exist and i think that's actually quite a a strong method and so in that chapter darren talks about we have to establish witnesses credibility we have to establish that they have uh they're suitable for the testimony but they don't have a testimony that's problematic so we don't want testimony that has excessive contradictions we don't want viewpoints that were far away or in the dark or of someone who you didn't recognize uh you know obstruction of all observation etc I won't go through all of them here for time's sake, but you get the point. If there's if there's testimony like that, we know that can often be unreliable in the context of eyewitness testimony in police cases. Uh, we need to be careful of that. So what kind of, of testimony would we be looking for then in terms of what we would theoretically need, right? What, what would be accurate? Well, I would say in the case of certain Marian apparitions, not all of them, but in some of them, we have an advantage here because some of them not only entail Mary just appearing to one person, sometimes it's appearing to multiple people. And often these are repeated events. You know, they're not always just one person saw a weird thing one time and then told everyone else. Sometimes these happen repeatedly in the same location multiple times in a way that could be replicated, right? In that way, sometimes under conditions that are relatively controlled. I think what's more interesting are uh, elements that follow that, such as people claiming to have been spontaneously healed after seeing these. And in those cases, we can look at and we can actually verify the person's medical history if they had seen a doctor so many times by looking at their records. And we can also repeat the experiment of, okay, are they healed now? Is the disease gone? We can replicate this. And so I would argue that under these particular parameters, we avoid most of the issues we would normally have with faulty memory, uh, cognitive biases, and so forth with eyewitness testimony. So Okay, what Marian miracles would sort of fall under this in this way? Well, I would point to just two for the sake of, of time here. One would be Lourdes, which uh, arguably is the most investigated, not perhaps with the apparitions themselves, but of the healing phenomenon associated with it. Lourdes is one of the most famous healing sites, if not the most in the world in southern France, beginning when a young girl named Bernadette Subaru at the age of 14 claimed to have seen a woman appear to her on 18 different occasions. And uh, towards the end of that, I believe it was the second to last one, uh, she identified the woman as the Virgin Mary when she was told, Je suis l'Immaculée Conception, or I am the Immaculate Conception. And I do apologize for my butchering of the French language there. But after this, the, the Virgin showed her a spring that could allegedly heal people and people claimed to start being healed. Now, no one is claiming that all of these are legitimate. Many of them are perhaps psychosomatic. This was also the late 19th century, and so misdiagnosis could be possible. Medical science was not exactly perfected even today, let alone then. So we don't want to say that all of these are automatically supernatural, right? But in many of these cases, there are documented ones where there was actually quite an impressive medical history. And although some of them could be attributed to misdiagnosis and so forth, other ones are quite hard to. For example, there are 70 officially recognized miracles in Lourdes between 1858 and 2018. Now they may seem small compared to the thousands of people that go there every year. But that's also is the only ones that the church have affirmed. It doesn't mean that the only ones that have been uh, passed the medical scrutiny. And of those 70, at least a, roughly a third of those are of things that are very visibly, uh, visually obvious. So things that wouldn't be easy to misdiagnose. So people who have tuberculosis sores that are eating away their face that are instantly healed. People who have fistula or ulcers or in one case a broken bone, which is what's pictured in the bottom left there, Pierre de Rudere which I did write a whole article on, but won't go into for the sake of time. So the Medical Bureau investigates these and usually encompasses hundreds of doctors in these. In fact, the most recent case, which was verified in 2018, involved a woman who had been suffering from extreme nerve damage for roughly several decades. And she was investigated by over 300 different doctors in this before the case was verified. So many of these are strange. Now, I'm not saying that spontaneous healing in and of itself is miraculous. People do get better all the time, but there are those Lambertini criteria that were on the prior slide that I didn't have time to go through, but I have discussed elsewhere that we're looking for. I don't just say that a healing is unexplained, but that it's non-natural in its observation based on those criteria. Something like instantaneity, permanency, completeness, 
from a history of organic uh, disease and progressive disease. The other one I want to quickly go into here is Our Lady of Zaytun, a case that both Jimmy and I have talked about on podcasts. And this is probably the most well attested in terms of number of people. In 19, uh, Zaytun is known for being the location in traditional orthodoxy for where Christians believe the Virgin Mary settled in Egypt when they were fleeing Herod from that. Now, that tradition perhaps is not very well attested historically, but uh, the context of it is. So a church was built there after a man had a dream where the Virgin Mary told him to build a church there and a miracle would appear. 40 years later, in 1968, apparitions start appearing. People see a woman on top and think that it's a woman who's about to jump off and commit suicide. And yet more people look and identify this as the Virgin Mary. Now, off the bat, we could say perhaps that's paradelia. Perhaps people in a sense of religious expectation get excited and see what they want to see. That is plausible. But this light kept appearing in the same spot in the church and in the surrounding courtyards routinely over the course of three years, at the, which is quite remarkable. And even when the power was cut, even when buildings were torn down, no source could be found by either police or local authorities. And so one can see different images of this. Some of them are quite blurry and don't look much like anything other than a strange light. Other ones looked quite a bit more distinct and one can see if they squint perhaps how one could see the Virgin Mary out of these. And some pictures are what alleged to be the Virgin Mary sitting there surrounded by incense holding the infant Jesus in that way. So this event led to thousands of Muslims converting to Orthodox Christianity or Coptic Christianity, I should say, and other healings purported as well. And there still is no generally agreed upon explanation for what exactly these weird light phenomenon were. Now, weird light phenomenon is not exclusive to religion. Certainly we have UFOs in context, but it is within the religious context. The fact that it's not just a strange light phenomenon, but one that routinely and consistently appeared on top of a church in which the Virgin Mary was originally believed to have performed a miracle and has a religious significance. So all of that in collection, I think, is what's relevant to the context here. So how does all of this relate to the two minutes? How do people, thank you. How do people being healed and seeing weird lights imply that, you know, something supernatural is going on? Well, I would say with a miracle, to use John's term, an outsider test of faith, we should be looking for uh, three things. One, the quality. How well attested? How good is the evidence? Is it just hearsay? What evidence do we really have? Two, and I would argue in the case of both of these, we have more witnesses in the case of Zaytun than in, than almost any other miracle in history. And in Lourdes, we have probably more scrutiny than almost any other miracle cases in history. Vindication, this miracle does not uh, primarily just occur to people who already believe, who are already religiously fervent, but it appears to deliver a message. It uses it to convert people. If God is going to perform an evangelistic miracle, it makes sense he would do this to convert people and not simply just to show off because he was bored. And of course, the context, miracles are not just anomalies. God is not just going to make a unicorn in the middle of Times Square because he feels like it. It seems more plausible that he would perform a miracle within a context where people could associate it with religions. And so if we have if we have phenomenon that is best inferred to as supernatural, and the phenomenon occurs directly within a context of Mary and apparitions in the Virgin Mary, especially in context in which Mary, Mary, I should say, claims that she is the Immaculate Conception, if we do take this to actually be Mary, that seems quite clear to me, at least, that this would allow us to infer that this is a pretty strong correlation between uh, Mary being vindicated by God. And it seems quite strange to think of a world in which Mary would be appearing to people and healing people and doing all these things, and yet Christianity or certain tenets of it not being true, at least when it comes to the virgin birth and Marian apparitions and Marian dogma. So with that, I will conclude, but uh, I do thank everyone for listening. So. All right. Great job. We've got about 20 seconds left on the timer. We're, we're going to now turn it over to Darren. He's got 10 minutes to uh, present. And Darren, whenever you start sharing your screen, I'll go ahead and put it up here. Um, and just as a, a quick note here. Okay. It looks like you, you have unmuted yourself. So uh, let me just get this pulled up here and we should be good to go. There we go. Okay. All right. Whenever All right. you're ready, uh, I'll start my timer. Can you see the screen? Yes. Perfect. Well, what I absolutely love about Caleb is uh, I would adore him as a student because he throws out, he wants to test things to see if anything sticks. And I love that. So it's really experimental apologetics, trying to take modern miracles and su uh, kind of superimpose it back on the ancient world. So I love that. Um, but kind of the whole Virgin Mary thing. And a lot of it seems really rapey to me. And here's some things that we need to take a look at. When we're talking about history and modern investigations, there are a number of presuppositions that we generally have, and this is to kind of maintain integrity 
in our research. One of them, you know this, the principle of uniformity, that the same natural laws and processes that operate today generally operated in the past as well. And that includes virgins not getting pregnant. You generally need sperm and an egg. The other thing, source criticism. This is one of the points that I was trying to make with Jimmy is that uh, just because the gospel of Matthew and maybe the gospel of Luke says it, doesn't actually mean your interpretation of it is correct. This is a literary document, not historiography. It is possible, and in fact, very likely that to the ancient mind, they were interpreting these stories wildly different than us in the 21st century. And then of course, historiography and investigating of paranormal events is both an art and a science. And there are certain rules that we generally keep in order to maintain the integrity of the investigation. Some of the fallacies that we want to avoid, of course, wishful thinking, just because we want the miracle doesn't mean it's there. Selective use of evidence. And this is where we cherry pick specific instances of modern miracles within a Christian context that align with the argument while neglecting instances that may not fit your narrative. Uh, incorrectly conflating different categories such as modern miracles versus ancient literary claims and then assume that evidence for one category translates to evidence to the other. I'm just skipping through a whole bunch of these. Uh, false analogies. Now, this is where you assume that a miracle is well evidenced in a modern context, and therefore it's analogous to the virgin birth in a literary context without considering the unique circumstances, claims, evidences, all that kind of stuff. And I want to probe more with the analogous thinking in this historiography. Um, Drawing on analogies like Marian apparitions, like the healing miracles at Lourdes, this is great stuff. Um, but the problem is it is meant to reinforce arguments. They are meant to be auxiliaries to prove. But if the original argument, such as the virgin birth, it does garbage, then no amount of analogies are ever going to make the garbage original argument true. Analogies should be used to persuade, communicate, clarify, illustrate. They are explanatory tools that they can't be used as substitutes for the explanation itself. So, for instance, Virgin Mary appears on the White House lawn, uh, but says there was no virgin birth. And this is actually fairly plausible, right? If she were to appear on CNN, she could tell us. The false analogy is trying to say an apparition somehow relates to the virgin birth or the virgin conception. Um, the false analogy kind of breaks down like this. The apparition in Zaytuni, Egypt uh, involved Jesus's mama. The virgin conception also involves Jesus's mama. The apparition in Zaytuni, Egypt is a bona fide miracle. Therefore, it's inferred that the virgin conception is a bona fide miracle. And that's just not how logic works. So we might take those first three prepositions to be factual, but the fourth is still an analogical inference. The first two prepositions in that are disparate. They're describing two different things, and that's where the problem is. See, the modern-day apparitions in Egypt and elsewhere, um, they are functionally connected to the modern-day aspects of evidence, such as the photographs you showed. And the process of corroborating and interpreting the events are wildly different. And something that I just am actually really surprised about is why you, when you look at those photos and other accounts that you conclude it's the Virgin Mary. And quite honestly, I, I'm baffled because I thought everybody knew it's actually the Egyptian goddess Iris or Isis. And she's here nursing baby Horus. I mean, that seems a heck of a lot more plausible. And, and of course it's in Egypt. So why isn't it that God? We automatically go in with a lot of these evidences presupposing the conclusion when the interpretation of the data is actually what's at issue. We go to Lourdes and using Lourdes to try and demonstrate previous miracles is actually, it's really clever, but it would fall under the absurd analogy. So I've just given an example here on the screen. Uh, this rubber ball and that apple are both red, round, smooth, and shiny. And the apple is good to eat. Therefore, the rubber ball must be good to eat. That kind of logic is absurd, 
right? The qualities of the ball and the apple are functionally relevant to aesthetics, but not edibility. Well, the same thing applies when we use the virgin conception and healings at Lourdes, because they both involve Catholic faith and Mary. And the healing at Lourdes is an historical fact, presumed. Therefore, the virgin conception is a historical fact. But again, the qualities are meant for Catholic faith, not historicity. And this is what we say when we mean uh, that it, it kind of breaks the rule of relevance, that there needs to be a relationship between X and Y in order for an analogy to uh, stand for A and B. And of course, some things that you didn't mention about Lourdes that I think we should know about, that the declining miracle rates. Uh, you know, in the uh, 30 years, the latter half of the 19th century, about 1,200 people claimed to have been miraculously healed. Then between 1909 and 1914, 411 people. Then 1947 and 1976, 25 people. Now, one verifiable from 76 to 2006. What happened? Modern medicine, science happened. Yeah, most miracles at Lourdes was confirmed during the Golden Age. Uh, before penicillin was even discovered. And in fact, the church has declared that they're no longer going to call spontaneous recovery a miracle uh, until they can get doctors to say that the disease itself is incurable. The church is relying on seven criteria devised back in the 18th century. And there are other medical bodies that have taken a look at some of the inexplicable miracles and have found explanations for them. And of course, then there's just the problem of the fact that, well, Mary kind of sucks at her job. Uh, she doesn't do missing limbs and amputees. She only seems to take care of cures or of disease that could spontaneously cure themselves sometimes. And of course, one of my favorite NBC News reported that the International Doctors Panel at Lourdes is getting out of the miracle business. Quote, it seems miracle may not be the right word to use anymore. End quote. That's from Bishop Jacques Perrier of Lourdes. In fact, uh, two, two minute warning. Thank you. They're also just going to say it's remarkable. I'll skip through this, but basically no proof for the virgin conception, some proof for modern miracles. That's a lot of weight to have to try and carry. I do think, though, that your overall argument does beg the question as a questionable modus bonus. Uh, basically, it's well evidence. If a uh, well evidenced miracle occurs today, then that serves as evidence of Christianity. Well, you simply asserted the conclusion as one of your evidences. Um, you used a premise as though it's true. And that's the problem. See, you have a good structure here with the argument. If A, then B, and A, therefore B. But the problem is your premise one hasn't been established. It's only assumed to be true. The assumption being that a miracle happened, therefore the Christian God, even in a Christian context. Um, Mary and Mick miracles are not repeated. They don't leave lasting effects. It's simply not true. Uh, Marian apparitions of supernatural nature somehow mean that Maria is responsible for it. This is what we call causal oversimplification, and you're assuming a necessary condition uh, is also a sufficient one. So what I would like to see, that we investigate properly people in, uh, who claim to have experienced or witnessed a miracle, vet them. Then can we rule out overactive imagination, fantasy proneness, dissociation, developmental disabilities or cognitive handicaps, misinformation effect, interviewer bias, uh, trauma, flashbulb memories, independent corroboration, any of that happen. All of this needs to happen first. A true, thorough fact-finding mission before we can conclude a bona fide miracle has taken place. And that's time. Right. Uh, did you, did you, uh, it looks like you're on your concluding slide. Would this, uh, take too long to just yeah. go ahead and conclude here? No, no. Uh, just the, uh, I'll let Craig Keener conclude this. He says, quote, the collection of miracle reports would not prove that any given claims to miracles in the past were authentic. That's it. 
All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to, uh, again, turn to a period of about 40 minutes where we're just going to have a back and forth between the Christians and the atheists on this topic specifically. So, um, but let's turn it back over to Caleb and uh, get his thoughts on Darren's opening presentation, and then we'll, you know, get uh, thoughts from everyone. Yeah, no, first of all, Darren, that was very good. Thank you for that. I liked all the little animations and stuff you had in the PowerPoint as well. I also have a lot of notes, so uh, <laughs> I don't entirely know where to start, um, whether we want to talk about method and um, inferences or whether we want to talk about specifics of lured or, or what have you. So uh, I don't know. Is there a particular place you want to take a stab at? Well, uh, address my argument that it's a false analogy to try and use modern day miracles uh, to prove or at least relate to the virgin conception. Do you have anything on that? Yeah, so I would say first we would have to ask what reasons, and this may uh, send into some natural theology, so you, you may disagree with some of the premises, but in terms of why we would think that God, or why not, I'll just say God, would perform a miracle in a certain way, right? So you could say, for one, well, maybe God wants to uh, show mercy on someone. Maybe he wants to stop them from being in pain and harm. Someone's sick, he wants to heal them. It's like, okay, God could do that, but does God really need to do that through through a miracle? Because God could prevent a disease, God could heal them through medicine, right? So that that may be perhaps one reason, but maybe not a primary reason. Well, maybe God wants to grow someone's faith and make them stronger. Again, that, that could be plausible, but God can also do that through internal spiritual experience. In fact, most people who pray, right, for relief, with like, God, please help me through this surgery, they're not really expecting God to do something extra normal in that way. It's, it's a calm inner sense of peace, right? So the third reason would be, okay, well, what's a way in which God could vindicate a me, uh, something else to show externally because internal religious experiences can't be held by, by uh, groups of people, only individuals. At least I can't see someone religious experience in the way that they can experience it. And so miracles are sort of the symmetry breaker as a sign to say God is vindicating a particular message. And so I think if God is going to do miracles, it is going to primarily be for that reason. It can include the other two, but it does need to have that factor. In fact, the word miracle, the Latin is miraculum, to wonder, right? So it's meant to be something that is observable to people to kind of be a stamp of vindication. So if miracles are signs of vindication, then it seems like there is some kind of message to be associated with it. And so if that's the case, then we can ask, okay, what is the message being vindicated here? And that would depend on the context. So if a prophet does something and does a miracle, if that prophet has a message say, hey, I'm from God, and they do something that presumably only God can do, then we may infer, okay, maybe this actually is God giving his stamp of approval if it were legitimately supernatural, right? And so if you have experiences that are seemingly natural and naturally inexplicable and we can and we could in theory rule those out and these are involved in a context in which the virgin a, a woman appeared who claims to have been the virgin mary who in zaitun you know predicted that i will appear on this church which is dedicated to mary and only appeared on a church dedicated to mary right that would be perhaps a better inference than the goddess isis because if that was the case it's weird that the goddess isis would appear on a church to the virgin mary and convince people that it was Mary and not correct them. It, that, that seems rather strange to me, unless you want to say it's some kind of deceptive thing. So I would say the context in which these occurred, in which Mary claimed it was herself, or at least people who purported seeing her claim that she had told them this, right, in combination with these other factors would be how we would infer that. And last thing I'll say, because I know I've been talking a long time, is that we do see these kind of inferences with people like when Harry Houdini, who you may know a little bit, um, after he died, he before he died, he had been investigating seances, right? And he showed most of the mediums were using trickery. And he was open to being convinced. And so he had proposed that there was a key word and that he would die and his wife would go around to mediums and people would be like, oh, I can communicate with your dead husband. And there was a, like a, um, a special key word that she never told anyone. They're saying, okay, if you're really talking to, to Harry, tell me what the word is. And so in theory, if that if the medium had been able to do that and the conditions were controlled and, and it had been successful, then according to Houdini's wife, that would have been sufficient to convince them that this really was the man they were talking to. Now, that never happened, which seems disconfirming. But the point is, miracles are meant to be those passwords that we would see, those special keys that unlock the door to say, hey, this is from God or this is from a supernatural being. It's not just something else. So that's my long answer to what you had originally asked. <laughs> Um, I think our wires got crossed there because I'm, I'm more addressing the structure of the argument, the, the logical fallacy known as false analogies, that you really can't, just because things are similar in some sense, doesn't actually mean that they are identical, right? Or that one 
really relates functionally to the other. And that's where I'm trying to go with it is more of just because Mary is involved, just because the Christian faith is involved, uh, doesn't actually prove that the virgin conception is an historical event. And I would disagree also with the definition or, or this expectation that a miracle is meant for vindication. It's just as plausible that miracles, if they were to occur at all, could also be meant to deceive the gullible. We don't have any reason to just assume God is the good guy or that he is just pure good and, and uh, rather than why not him be a trickster? Why not him be evil and malicious? Uh, doing these things is a lot of assumptions that come in and that's the problem. Yeah. So I, uh, I don't want to, I mean, by the way, if John or Jimmy has something that they want to say as well, I would just say when it comes to the, the last point, I don't want to get too caught up on, on metaphysics here, but I would short answer it. I would say, if you're going to say that God is a prime mover who doesn't have arbitrary limits, right? He has, there's nothing holding him back. I think God would be omniscient. And I think God's omniscience entails that he knows all things which would mean that he would be perfectly rational and that would include rationale about morals. And so God would have perfect knowledge of the good and would always want to choose the good. Now that's a different model than some other theists would have. It's more, you know, a theistic personalist view, not a classical theist view of good. But under that view, I would say it's entailed that God has to have perfect knowledge of the good given his omniscience. And so I don't even see the idea of a trickster God or a like an evil God to be even be really cogent by that standard uh, on that point. But um, I don't, I don't want to get too off topic on that particular point, but yeah. Do you have anything to say to that? Or does anyone else want to, um, to hop into anything that was said there? I, I, I can hop in. Um, I have a couple of comments. Um, the first one is something I really didn't expect to say. Um, but Darren, in your presentation, you began with a slide depicting God seducing Mary and Joseph as a cuckolded husband. And then you followed it up by saying, this seems rapey to me, even though we have the Virgin Mary explicitly saying in Luke chapter two, be it done unto me according to your word. So that was consent, which was an issue you raised. You also said Mary sucks at her job. And it's clear that you have a rather high estimation of yourself and not such a high estimation of the feelings of others. But when I heard you say to compare with Mary's consent to her becoming the mother of Jesus to being rape, I thought, wow, that is not only inaccurate, that's just nasty. And, and uh -oh. I, was turned, I was turned off by that. Right. I'm sure other people were too. Yeah. <laughs> However, I'm not trying to cancel well, anyone. I'm, I'm, and it, right? you're talking over me again. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to give you good advice. Keep it, like I'm I'm trying to give you good advice. You win more hearts if you keep it clean. I having said that, advice, having but, said but, that, but, having said that, I also had thoughts about some of the things you said. Um, I agree. Now, here's a point of agreement. I would agree that you can't look at a collection of modern miracles and say, these miracles happened, they were genuinely paranormal or genuinely supernatural, therefore the virgin birth happened. That's not the structure of the argument, and Caleb can correct me, but that's not the structure of the argument that Caleb is making. One can look at modern miracles and say, these, therefore miracles are possible. One can look at modern miracles occurring in a Catholic context and say, or a Christian context and say, therefore, we've documented that miracles in a Christian context is possible. And based on a coherence theory of truth or coherence theory of justification, um, that would tend to, re to reinforce the Christian system as a whole, including things like the virgin birth, but it doesn't prove any specific prior miracle. So I would agree with you up to a point there. I would also note that you you did some apples and oranges, apples and orange comparisons, like when you were talking about the number of healings at Lourdes. Uh, you said that, that 1,200 people 
claimed to be healed between 1857 and 1889. But you didn't say 1,200 people had verified claims of miracles in that period. You then said, but there's only been one verified miracle between 1976 and 2000. Yeah, that's a verified miracle, not a miracle claim. So you're doing apples and oranges comparison. Sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but that that's from 2000. It's from the la- in the last decade, I believe it was from 2012, 2013 and 2018, there have been three more. So okay, it, that's I, great. I, that that's just, great. Yeah. yeah, I would just note that you're making apples and oranges comparisons in order to inflate the numbers and make it look like a more dramatic decline than it is. Also, who says the number is going to stay constant throughout the rest of history? Um, miracles are uncommon. They don't always have to stay at a constant rate. Then you said that there are no cases of missing limbs or amputees having missing limbs restored. Well, actually, there are. And Craig Keener has documented some of those. So that was another mistake. It's not a huge mistake in what you said, but it was a mistake. And just on that point, because I know well, Darren already wrote a chapter critiquing Keener, so I don't think that would impress him much. But there is a case, and I didn't bring it up here, not in Lourdes, but in Zaragoza, Spain, of an alleged amputee getting a leg back. And I, I'm writing a whole chapter on that. So actually, I, did, I talked about it a little bit on Cam's show and I've done other podcasts. So I can send that if you're interested. But that one, we do have signed affidavits from doctors saying, I saw it off the leg and we saw him as a beggar and so forth. But not saying that that's convincing, but there are cases out there that, that do follow that, that are within a Marian context. But I'll, I'll just have this a tangent. John, you've been quiet this whole time. Oh, I, I was uh, I was waiting for Darren uh, to to t- come back up. You know, I think sometimes we um, we enjoy a little bit of humor at, at someone else's expense. You know, uh, on that, um, uh, and one might say, uh, as, as whatever what else you might say, that um, I, I just as children are, are not consensual adults by virtue of them being children. Uh, I think that when it comes to a god. Um, a woman, a, a young maiden, maybe I don't know how old. Let's say she's eighteen. Uh, couldn't couldn't consent either. I mean, it's not a consent. You can't consent to God. He, sure, he's, you can. He, he overwhelms you. You know, aren't you the first one to say that God can't show His presence uh, fully to us? Otherwise, He would uh, mandate belief. I don't say that. Well, don't you? <laughs> Well, then think through it, because I think a lot of people do say say that. If God oh, is, is clear as day in, in your face, you could not believe. God could suspend so people's think, free will if he chose, but that's not what he's done. He I hasn't done he that did. in my case, and I freely chose to believe in him. Similarly, I wish God would do that. I wish God would do that. Therefore, you know, you put people in prison uh, just to, who are going to be uh, bad people. Why couldn't God just uh, keep people from doing things? You know, But okay. Well, uh, still, I'm just trying to make some sense of what uh, Darren said. Yeah, I don't think it does make sense because we have the Virgin Mary clearly consenting, and to prop up his his uh, crass uh, statement, you're now proposing a, a, a theory for which we have no evidence, which is God overrode Mary's free will. But this is a mere style point. I don't want to get distracted by that because Maybe it doesn't address the substance of our discussion. He was just being a jerk. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry your feelings were hurt by uh, having a sense of humor. Classy but answer she there, Darren. She didn't consent. She didn't consent. Sorry. Um, yeah. Just because yeah. she was already pregnant <laughs> afterward. She was already pregnant. So now I, I do I do have one thing to ask. I mean, I know that people are switching uh, between Christianities. I know you were a, what, a Presbyterian minister, became Catholic. Uh, mm-hmm. I, well, no. I was a Presbyterian. I was on a ministerial track, but I became a Catholic first. Uh, I was close enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I have to be precise there, uh, or not? No, I was just, 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 just answering your question. All right, uh, but uh, you know, I used to, you know, be a minister in the Protestant faith, and I never really gave any serious credence to any of the Marian miracles. You know, I because it kind of leads credence to the idea that uh, the other ideas that go with it, like she's immaculately conceived. And uh, she's uh, to be prayed to. You can get, you can pray to, to Mary, and maybe she can get to Jesus, which sounds ludicrous to someone like uh, like me, uh, even now. But uh, I never gave much credence to these Marian miracles, and uh, so I would think that uh, you're trying to convince atheists, uh, non-believers in general, uh, of Marian 
miracles is, is even harder to do when you can't even create people within their own house, you know, the house of Christianity. Can I just say, John, that I am actually not a Catholic nor Orthodox. I'm not a non yeah. Christian. So a lot of people are quite surprised when I defend so stuff tell, like this. Tell me I, more I also, about that. I also find it, just to chime in with you, uh, Caleb, I find it highly ironic, and, and I think the audience will be will be entertained by this. I, the Catholic, made my case on the Bible. You, the Protestant, made your case on Marian miracles and apparitions. I think yeah. that's ecumenism in action. That go, go team ecumenism. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Yeah. That that is that's pretty funny. No, but that that is good. Well, I mean, it's also interesting because you have people like uh, Jacqueline Duffin, right, who's one of the top scholars on looking at canonization miracles about you know saints interceding and healing people, and she's an atheist and she's not converted to Catholicism, but she's at least saying, well, at least there's something here and it's weird, and I just withhold mm -hmm. judgment, which I think is a respectful position, but. Um, I, look, I am sympathetic because I do have my own theological convictions for not wanting certain things to be true or, or holding off on making inferences, right? So I understand where that's coming from. But I also think that one can say that, you know, if God is going to be doing, if we're granting these are supernatural, some of them are supernatural, that if God is going to be doing these, it does seem rather strange that he would be deliberately provoking people to have false theology, encouraging them to do pilgrimages and stuff like that, to have it to where people think they're praying to mirror and all this stuff for the sake of it, when if he wanted to simply heal people, he wouldn't have to do it at a certain site with Marian significance, he could do it, or he could only do it in a particular denomination. So uh, I, I feel like those inferences are, are kind of locked in with the context, and it's hard for me to, to separate that. Uh, did we have, I'm trying to see, look over it all, uh, if anyone can chime in if they want, because I'm looking through um, some of these. There well, was a I point would like I to get, I would like to get Go more ahead. of Darren's perspective on like why why he thinks that there's this disconnect between these sort of yeah. Marian miracles apparitions and you know the truth of the virgin birth. So if he could, Darren, if you could just kind of come back on that, share some some more thoughts and explain yeah. where, where sure. the disconnect is so, happening. I mean, it, it's a it's a clever way of going of testing a theory, a testing an apologetic, but it really just doesn't hold any water. You can't take one event today and say this demonstrates something in the past or can add credibility to something in the past. Even if I were to grant you, let's say Mary is really the queen of heaven and she comes down, she very well could say, Jimmy, you misunderstood. You completely misinterpreted the, the story in Matthew. It's not meant to be historicity. It's, or it's meant to be an allegory. Um, there was no virgin birth. That's perfectly plausible. And why I bring that up is because that kind of demonstrates there is no actual functional relationship or correlation between the two. She, we can have ghost sightings all day long. It doesn't mean that something in the ancient past actually occurred or that your interpretation of a story about something in the past actually is correct. Does that make yeah. sense? It does. I mean, it is possible to 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 misinterpret something, um, but simply saying you're misinterpreting this does not provide any evidence that a misinterpretation has occurred. In fact, um, on regarding the historicity of the um, of the infancy narratives and specifically of the virgin birth, this is something we have abundant evidence for in the New Testament and in other early Christian documents, including other ones in the first century. The Ascension of Isaiah, for example, um, which was written in about the year AD 67, uh, between the martyrdom of Peter and the, ex and the suicide of Nero, it um, is very explicit about the virgin birth. And um, it's clearly based on independent traditions other than those found in the Gospels and other than those reflected in Paul. And consequently, we see a widespread belief in the virgin birth in first century Christianity, both inside and outside the New Testament, within just a few years of the crucifixion. And so, and this was consistently interpreted in a historical sense that this really happened. So it, that's not just my conclusion, that's the conclusion of biblical scholars, 
uh, regardless of whether they're believing Christians or not, they concluded, yeah, the early Christians believed Jesus was really born of a virgin. It's the conclusion of the vast majority of people who've read the Gospels and other early Christian literature. So if you want to say, oh, well, this has been misinterpreted at some kind of metaphor, you can say that, but you need to give me some kind of evidence to show why the interpretation is wrong. Merely asserting it is not enough. I need to see some evidence for that. Well, you know, I, mean, I could those back I could see where you as well, just because you're asserting it. Uh, of course, the ancient people interpreted it literally. They also thought Jupiter and Mars came down in human form and did those things as well. That is the worldview of ancient superstitious people. Of yeah, course. and I wouldn't I wouldn't say with regard to pagans who believe Jupiter and Mars came down, I wouldn't say that, oh, those pagans were engaging in some kind of metaphor. I'd say, yeah, they believe Jupiter and Mars really came down. So, and, and, so you haven't and, justified and a, a metaphor claim here. And likewise, you know, they didn't know any better about stars and planets, and uh, they didn't know anything about uh, genetics and what would be required of of a virgin birth, and they didn't know anything about uh, the census, those people who were considering that. I mean, after all, um, sure they you know, well, no, I mean, it's like- it's They had like, to pay taxes to the Romans. They knew about censuses. Well, I, I know that, but that's it. The, the census was always about taxes. You know, that's no, what they did. They went by, yeah, that's that's what my research, I mean, it's always had to do with who who can we tax and why and what do they, what do they know? So um, they had, they didn't have a lot of um, means to investigate some of the tales and the stories that were told in the virgin birth and narratives. So no wonder they believed it. It's, and, and they concluded that if Jesus was rose, risen from the dead, that therefore, how did he get into the earth? That's, you know, he must have come by virtue of a virgin birth. That's the real reason why the story of the virgin birth is in there. Uh, it's not because of any uh, evidence. It's because, well, if Jesus rose from the dead and therefore, um, he must have come here by reason of a virgin birth. Okay, so, Jimmy, I, let's, get, like let's, let's, let's get Caleb, I, let's, let's get Caleb to, to mm -hmm. respond. Well, I wasn't even going to respond to that because that's a bit more with the first part, part. But I was going to ask if Darren or John wants to. So when it comes to like the retroactive historiography is what I would call it in terms of putting that back on, how do you feel about, uh, and there have been a couple papers on these, when people take things like uh, modern understandings of mental illness and, and diagno diagnostics, right? Uh, that are relatively recent historically. And then they try to say, well, look, we can look and see that Caligula, the Caesars had these symptoms. And so it's possible that Caligula had epilepsy or multiple personality disorder. Same thing with Jesus's exorcisms, right? They'll say, well, look, demon possession may have been mental illness back in the day. And so are we, do, would you say that that's plausible historically we can do that? Or are you adverse to doing that in terms of saying we can take modern understandings of things and putting back to say, oh, demon possession may have been mental illness because there's certain things that we see in common and certain Roman emperors may have had these because we're seeing similar symptoms or, or would you just be averse to, to that at all? Yeah, that's a, no, that's a great question. Um, it's actually a, a well-known problem in historiography. So um, there was one author some time ago who had taken a look at some of the psychological studies done on concentration camp prisoners after the war. And this historian superimposed the psychological stuff on the Holocaust survivors back onto African slaves and said they likely suffered from similar things. Now, while you can do this in the sense of trying to draw or come up with some theories, you can't say because of the constant what we know from the concentration camps therefore we know this about the african slave trade or the effects of african slavery does that make sense mm -hmm. so yeah it would actually be and, and that author did get a lot of grief about it because it is bad historiography it is bad methodology yeah and i i, I can sympathize with that especially since Mental illness is already hard to diagnose, even when you have a person sitting in front of you, let alone doing it from texts of a person writing secondhand describing someone. So I, I can definitely understand that hesitancy, although I, I don't see why in principle, if you could, if you could draw proper analogies to say people who suffer from these things have these symptoms. And so and that's like what it checked out. I don't I'm not sure why in principle that would be methodologically flawed, but I, I think actually applying it in the cases we have may be much more difficult because there's so much nuance and so much controversy even within mental health as a general field let alone doing it on historical figures but uh yeah i i guess but i i guess i was just trying to say i feel like there are analogies that we do see people draw 
in historiography to things or you'll say like even earlier we're doing with Jupiter, right? Being that I know that one was contested, but I'm sure there are phenomenon that uh, I'd have to go back and see that people have said, oh, that might have been this star. This might have been this certain phenomenon of wind blowing this thing. And that's why Alexander was able to cross a, a sea at a certain point or something, you know, things like that. So I guess it seems like we can make, I know you use the term analogical inferences. Yes, sometimes analogies can be inapt, but other times analogies are accurate. It really depends on what criteria we need for an accurate analogy. And all I'm trying to say is that, yes, if there was just a general weird supernatural phenomenon, I don't think that alone would be enough to infer anything in particular. But if you have a supernatural phenomenon, that we presume, presuming it is supernatural, if you could demonstrate that with a degree of probability, and you could say, okay, what context is this? What is the point? Well, the being that claims to have appeared says, hey, this is me. This is my intentions. I don't see why it's implausible to say, oh, maybe that's a good avenue to look at. Let's look at that theory. This being, this apparition is proposing, this is what she's here to do. Maybe we should at least take that into consideration, right? All else being equal. So in Darren's example, if, if an apparition did appear and say, and, and, and it was well evidenced and said the virgin birth is actually not true, and, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are right or something. I know they believe in the virgin birth, but, you know, some fringe one. I think we'd have to take that into consideration. I don't think that alone would be uh, enough, but it would at least be some evidence, I think, against it. And it would uh, convict me of that, I think. Just as if, um, I, you know, I, I've heard people say, uh, I, I'm not saying that you all are saying this, but I've heard atheists say, well, you know, if, if Christ appeared to me and I could feel it like Thomas, then I would believe. It's like, oh, so if you, if Christ appeared to you today and show you, does that mean that therefore he rose from the dead 2,000 years ago and that those stories are true? Even if Jesus appeared to you and say, hey, this is true, touch me, feel me. A lot of people seem to think that that would be persuasive. So maybe you all aren't of that ilk. I don't want to presume that, but um, I, I, I guess it just doesn't seem to me like that's a bad inference to make. Well, it's not, it's not about being hyper-skeptical. And it's not about always just prepping on any evidence or anything like that. But there does need to be a healthy dose of skepticism. People are gullible. And that's where I think the kernel of the problem here is that you want to assume that the Marian apparitions are valid and that the interpretation is valid. So even if I were to grant you that the Marian apparitions are some kind of supernatural thing, uh, or maybe we should say extra normal thing, right? Sure. Yeah. Doesn't actually mean that it is connected to the Virgin Mary in any way. Why not have it be an ancient Egyptian goddess? Why not it make, why not it be parallel universes or extraterrestrials or overlords, right? I have it's, an answer to that question. It's well, let's, let's let Darren finish his thought. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's the, it's the interpretation that I think starts mm -hmm. to unravel. Go for it. Hold on, just before yeah. Jimmy goes, but if the being gives, if the being tells you, hey, this is the interpretation, like in Lord's, I am the immaculate conception, I am this, would that not at least push the needle a little bit into thinking that? I know you said it could be a deceptive spirit, right? And that would be something we'd have to look at, but is that not at least a de facto kind of default one of saying, okay, this is what this being is saying it is? Maybe we could look at that hypothesis. Yeah, uh, and these are hypotheses, right? And they need to be tested, and that's what is not happening. And uh, you choose a hypothesis based off of what is internally coherent, consistent with known facts, and has the best explanatory power. And I don't think the Catholic interpretation of those apparitions um, hold water compared to a lot of the other more natural explanations. Jimmy, would you like to come yeah. in or Caleb, do you have any well, other yeah. follow up? Um, so yeah. as to the question of how do we know whether it's Mary or Isis on the top of a Christian church in Egypt, um, I would recommend a principle from philosophy known as phenomenal conservatism. Phenomenal conservatism is um, the principle that the appearances need to be taken at face value until such evidence, until such time as evidence emerges that they should be taken in a different sense. Um, this is actually a fundamental principle of rational thinking. Um, it doesn't hold the appearances as absolutes, but it does say you need to start with how something appears until you get evidence it should be taken another way. So for example, if you come home and there's a woman there who appears to be your wife, 
you should assume it's your wife until such time as you get evidence that it's actually an evil twin who has knocked out your wife and tied her up in the closet. It would be paranoid to come home and see someone who in every way appears to be your wife and just say, oh, how do I know that's not an evil twin that I don't have any evidence for? So we need to start with the appearances of how things seem and then revise that as we get evidence to the contrary. So if you see what appears to be the Virgin Mary appearing on top of a church, as opposed to what appears to be Isis appearing on the top of an ancient Egyptian temple, I would assume it's the Virgin Mary. We, until such time as I get evidence that it's ISIS or someone else. Same way if someone says, hi, my name is Bob Smith, I'm going to assume that person is Bob Smith until I get evidence that they were lying. And if someone, if an apparition shows up and says, hi, I'm the Immaculate Conception, I'm going to assume it's the Virgin Mary until I get evidence to the contrary. So I'm not saying you can't get evidence to the contrary, but I am saying you should start with the assumption that things are how they are appear until you get evidence to overcome that appearance. And just to add on to that, Jimmy, real fast, sorry, is that I would also po just point out, because you, what you said was correct in terms of the thing, that you probably know this as well, Jimmy, that uh, when the church was originally built in the, I think it was in the 20s, uh, yeah. Ibrahim uh, had, a, had a vision or a dream in which he, he claimed the Virgin Mary appeared to him saying, hey, don't build a hotel here, build a church here, and I'll reward the miracle. So we have in the context as well, someone who built the building in which these, phenomenon occurred saying, Hey, the Virgin Mary appeared to me and said that she was going to do something. And then we see weird yeah. stuff happening. After that, right. So you could, I mean, of course, and of course look, the natural hypothesis is going to be, well, that creates social expectations. So we would have to look at that. I'm not saying that proves it, but within the context that would be relevant. And you also don't see, because Mary is a very revered figure in Islam, right? Which is what Egypt is the majority Muslim, but you know, I, it is curious that you never see uh, this happen on top of a, uh, of a mosque. It was always on top of, a, of an Orthodox Coptic church. And this is also not the only time that it's happened. There's, I think seven other apparitions in Egypt from 1970s to, I think the most recent one was 2009 in Warak. So it's, it's a weird trend to see weird lights appearing on top of churches with power cut and so forth and no projection device found and people thinking it's the Virgin Mary uh, routinely in Egypt, a country which believes and reveres Mary as having crossed through there to have Jesus during, you know, the Virgin birth and fling hair. So I'll just point that out as well. Well, well from uh, my perspective, uh, you know, human beings are believing creatures. I mean, they, they believe a lot. Uh, they, they don't really, uh, subject things to skepticism very often they're they're made uh, in such a way i mean they, they've evolved in such a way that it's better to believe because you can stay within your tribal uh, communities and being in your tribal communities provides safety so we have to develop the tools of skepticism we have to maybe um, uh, suffer from a scam artist and all of a sudden uh, it raises our awareness that we need to uh be more skeptical but sometimes just by looking at and around and, and and studying the world religions and the things that people are believing and and have believed and will believe uh with no evidence at all for them that you know it's it's um it's something you, that we need to be concerned about when we discuss this issue now just consider for instance uh Elvis still receives sightings no no serious uh, now some of them might be just lies and you know just trying to like make make people laugh but there are all kinds of things that people are believing if you have a if you're a fan of something if you if you really revere something or someone or some idea uh, there's a lot of people who will develop fantasies about them and they they will see things and then hear things and then uh it's it's uh we we have to be skeptical about these things and i know that caleb you want to be you, you made a pretty good presentation there no doubt but um it, it doesn't prove anything like Darren is saying. It's just, it doesn't prove much about the texts of the New Testament, which I've shown uh, didn't have any evidence for me. You can continue believing despite the evidence. And you go back and look at my PowerPoint. I'll publish something on my blog, debunking Christianity, which, which have links to all these kinds of things. But uh, we have to be skeptical about these sorts of things, more than, than most people are. I would agree that we need to be skeptical in the sense of using critical thinking. We all need to do that. 
which is essentially a way of fighting confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is something that all human beings have, and we need to fight that, and that's important. Um, by the way, since you mentioned your blog, I'll mention that I have material responding to your uh, claims um, regarding the infancy narratives <clears throat> on my blog at jimmyakin.com slash Bart, where I have a whole bunch of things that I wrote responding to Bart Ehrman on the reliability of the New Testament, and they cover the same ground. So I'd recommend that. But I do want to agree, you know, find common ground where we can, that people need to be skeptical. They need to, in the sense of using critical thinking, they need to fight confirmation bias. One thing I would differ on, though, is you made several statements about people having no evidence for something. And I find this is common among people who tend to come from a self-professed, skeptical, atheistic background. They'll frequently say, people have no evidence for their religion, none at all. And I, I, I have to say that I think that's inaccurate and also a hasty generalization. I would not say that about people, including people who have religions that are different than mine. I would not say that a Muslim has no evidence for Islam. I would say the evidence, if I looked at it, wouldn't probably wouldn't convince me, but I'm not going to say he has no evidence. If, if I'm thinking about a Hindu, I'm not going to say a Hindu has no evidence for Hinduism because there are elements of truth in Hinduism and yep. you can have evidence for elements of truth. I wouldn't say that an atheist has no evidence for his view. I might not agree with the conclusions he draws based on that evidence, but I wouldn't cavalierly say that people who have other religions than mine have no evidence for their views. Well, I, don't, I don't say that about everyone. I, I said mm -hmm. some people, I think, and if I didn't, I'm going to okay. say now some people have no no evidence. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what I do say is um, if you go back and look at my uh, slide presentation, I, I say what does not count as evidence. And if you go through those items, what doesn't count for evidence uh then given those things that's all you have and that is no evidence at all so um in my in my case since i've studied christianity and, and now philosophical that's something else but philosophical proofs show nothing about the uh, the resurrection of jesus or, or the virgin birth i mean you could have philosophically you could have a, a belief in god but that god has to have some evidence for him and the only way we can find evidence for his existence is the evidence of, say, the Bible and, and any corroborating evidence in history. And you don't have that. And the, Jesus might have raised from the dead. The, the virgin might have given birth. But my point is that given what we see in the New Testament documents, Mary being the only person, think about how, how anyone could actually research into Mary's claim. I mean, you can't. It has to have been given by inspiration. You have to believe that there's no evidence. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a, a you know, a, a, a something but but see that what that is is that's no evidence at all an inspiration claim uh is no evidence at all just look at the prophets in the old testament uh, joel and jonah and others they say the lord lord came from me or the spirit talked to me or or uh being in the spirit of god i say this uh th there's three two chapters in the book of revelation the second and the third that were dictated to john the Re revelator by god himself now, now that's that's a claim to inspiration that I can't back up. I can't investigate. So inspiration isn't something we can see only if there's a corroborative evidence of what it claims. And what I've said in my presentation would and could easily elaborate on is that the, the what you think is evidence isn't evidence. Well, then we have a difference on what counts as evidence. And unfortunately, at this late stage in our discussion, we don't really have time to have a thorough discussion of what would or should count as evidence in a particular circumstance. You've clearly stated your position that you think that what I count as evidence or what I might propose as evidence wouldn't count in your view. Um, so we have different views. But unfortunately, we don't really have time left in the discussion to try to adjudicate that and figure out who's right. So we'll have to agree to disagree on that. I don't um, think you can dispute what I, what I put in the slide presentation as not being evidence. Well, I'd say that's your opinion, but I would dispute it. I think there are more kinds of evidence than you're giving credit credit to. You think a subjective feeling is evidence or that second hand, third hand, fourth hand testimony is, is that evidence? Yeah, um, second, third and fourth hand testimony is evidence. It's not as strong as first hand testimony, but it is evidence. Um, all we have, we, all we have on the virgin birth, well, second hand testimony at best. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Isn't the unless, question unless unless God is the primary author of the New Testament, in which case we have firsthand evidence because He was there. But, but the miracles you are used as evidence that the, that God exists, and I'm saying that all you have is that kind of evidence. You can't show that the God of the philosophy is the God of the Bible, because in order to see that, you have to have some credible evidence in the Bible that God, in fact, did miracles that he says. And I, I have disputed that in many of my books. There is no evidence uh, of that like that. No. It is pretty It is pretty circular. To uh, uh, let, me, uh, let, let me address, you know, Jimmy, you had mentioned the phenomenal conservatism and the way you had presented that analogy, coming home, seeing your wife, right? you assume that there is that's all the information that there is and mm -hmm. that's the problem there isn't this massive void of information we actually have a lot so using your analogy you come home see somebody that looks like your wife but you know that she does have an identical twin oh and you know your wife died five years ago so the other information does, in fact, inform us when it comes to Marian apparitions and healing miracles and all this stuff. It isn't just, well, people saw Mary up on top of that church. Therefore, it must be Mary. How naive. We know so much about psychology and how we perceive things, what goes on in the brain that distort our perception of reality. So to think that it's just, well, my eyeballs saw Mary, therefore it must be Mary. There's more well, to it. There was more to it. Now, in your scenario where I know my wife has an evil twin and so forth, and I know my wife died five years ago, and in fact, my actual wife died 31 years ago. But um, in that situation, you've changed the circumstances. You haven't challenged the principle of phenomenal conservatism. All you've done is changed the situation in which it's being applied. In I the same way, more, in the same, I, in, I need to finish my point. I need to finish my point. In the same way, in the situation in Zaytun, it wasn't just people looked up and saw a blob that looked like the Virgin Mary to them. And, and some of them did conclude that, but not all of them. There was other information in that situation, including various he miracles of healing that happened when people prayed to her. They interacted with her. They, it was more than just visual sightings. So there was additional evidence and it continued to appear to be the Virgin Mary based on the evidence that people had in their situation. So phenomenal conservatism is not challenged. If the information you have is consistent with the way things appear, you should stick with the way things appear. When you get evidence that they're not the way they appear, like this woman I'm seeing actually died five years ago, that's not consistent with what I'm seeing, well, then I should revise my opinion. But if all, the evidence is consistent in one direction, you should stick with the appearance. So I do need to mention before we move on, uh, we are basically at time. So we've, we've gone about two hours. So we have at this point uh, a chance to wrap things up. We could go a little bit longer because we haven't had too many questions uh, sent in so far. So that time that we were putting aside to, to do some Q and A with the audience, um, since we haven't got a whole lot of questions come in, we could just do, uh, sort of extend the debate a little bit, just talk a little bit longer, or we could transition at this point into some brief, you know, off the top of your head, closing statements that we could, uh, and then we could sort of wrap things up. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave it to you guys. Would you rather, would you prefer to extend the debate, kind of wrap things up? What would you guys like to do? Are we excluding the possibility of taking questions from the listeners? Well, I, I did mention that I did mention that earlier. Um, we just mm -hmm. haven't. I've been keeping an eye on the live chat. I just haven't seen a whole lot of questions come in. Now, having mm -hmm. said that, we could start to to get a whole bunch of questions come through. So it that is a possibility. But um, it's up to you guys what you'd like to do. And if you do see questions, please address who it's for, unless you want to say it's for one side because there's also four of us, and that could get kind of confusing. No, Cameron, do you have any questions listening to this in terms that came to your mind on either side? I know you're moderating or um, not. Yes. But. Yeah, I, I'm doing my best to to stay out of it um, as as much as I can. the The thing that really interested me uh, toward toward the end here is this this sort of I forget the term that you used, Caleb, where uh, the retro 
active historiography. historiography. Yeah. Yeah. I think I made um, it. Yeah, that that to me is is a sort of open question in my mind. Like, if we can use these modern miracles to affirm something like the the virgin birth, I think that the. I mean, I'd like to hear more back and forth on that specific topic, but mm -hmm. that's. I don't really have a, like a question that I could ask to sort of set you guys up. But yeah. well, I um, think it's. I, mean, I, I found that pretty fascinating. That's fifteen minutes about phenomenological conservatism in terms of making those. I, I don't know what else we can really say that hasn't been said unless one, unless someone else has another point. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that. it would, it would, just, we would just have to sort of extend the debate a little bit. Well, let's right. do this. I mean, it sounds like you guys are, are cool with, uh, with sticking with us for, for a little bit longer. So let me just invite the audience. If you have a, a question, you can send it as a super chat. If you'd like, you don't have to, it's definitely not a necessity in order to have your, your question asked tonight. But if we do start to get some questions in, then we can put them on the screen and get some, uh, some interaction from the debaters tonight. And, uh, as Caleb mentioned, it would be helpful if you addressed who your question is addressed to, whether it be Jimmy, Caleb, John, or Darren. So, uh, please specify in your comment who your question is addressed to. And uh, we'll, we'll take some of those. But in the meantime, while we're waiting on those questions to, uh, to come in, I'll turn it back over to you guys. I think, Jimmy, was it you that was about to to respond? Or was it oh, Darren? Or, I, I, well, I can't remember. I, I, I've I've lost several threads uh, over the course of the evening. I think <laughs> that we likely all have. Um, the I, I did have a thought where I could ask... Um, where I could ask Caleb and see how his view on on um, use of modern miracles compares to support historical systems compares to my view. Um, my view would be that that Darren is correct that you can't say modern mar modern miracles occur or modern Marian miracles occur. Therefore, the virgin birth is true without intermediate steps. But sure. you can provide intermediate steps that at least lend support to the virgin birth. Because what you can say is modern miracles occur, they occur in a Christian context, and that provides evidence favoring Christianity. Now, it doesn't prove christianity by itself. It, you'd have to look at other religions and what miracles they have too, but it at least provides evidence supporting Christianity. And one of the one of the claims of Christianity is that the virgin birth occurred, and therefore, if you have evidence in the form of miracles that supports Christianity, and Christianity claims the virgin birth occurred, then transitively, that evidence would support the virgin birth in an indirect manner. So this is the of justification, where you have different ideas that cohere Jimmy, with you each Jimmy, you cut out for a second, and it looks like your video is is actually paused. Are you there? Uh oh. Uh oh. We we may have to just wait for him to uh, to come back. It looks like it might be a a connection issue. We did actually have a, a super chat come in, but it's addressed to Jimmy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah as these things tend to go. Um, well, let's do this. Okay, while we're waiting for, for Jimmy to come back, uh, we do have a question for Darren. So let me put that one up on the screen here. Question for Darren. How is it not a fallacious analogy to hold more goes on in the brain when seeing Mary, uh, when seeing Mary, when you said it was fallacious with Caleb's retroactive, retroactive historical approach? Yeah, great question. So, uh, because I'm not using an analogy here. Uh, an analogy is where you take two disparate things and say, yep, there's something similar. They're similar in one respect. So therefore, maybe they're similar in other respects. Uh, the image of the, what we know about the brain, neuroscience, psychology, all that kind of stuff is just simple hard evidence that we have about how humans operate. So I'm not making a comparison. I'm saying this needs to be considered when we are talking about ghost sightings, alien sightings, or the millions of other miracles that are claimed all over the world for a whole bunch of different religions. We need to consider other factors first before we make the leap to, yep, Mary came back. Can I just so ask for clarification though? Because I, I understand that, but is 
I, I was under the presumption that in this dialogue we were granting for the sake of argument if we could demonstrate that these were likely supernatural, then inferring the specifics like which you know which god is it or something like that. But it seems like in this question, it's can you know how do we infer it's supernatural? It could be hysteria, it could be cognitive biases and all these things, which I agree are an issue that would have to be addressed. But I had presume for the sake of discussion, we were assuming that all of that was addressed and we were just getting into the aspects of what kind of supernatural thing that is. Now, if, if Darren is saying that those cognitive roles still inhibit that inference as well, then I understand that if that was his point. Yeah. Just, uh, just to jump no. in on that, I would, I would agree that uh, with Darren um, and with Caleb, because I think they're on the same page regarding this, that yeah. naturalistic explanations have to be looked at first mm -hmm. before you conclude that something is supernatural. I actually happen to be trained. I mean, I've taken classes in paranormal investigations and I'm actually certified as a paranormal investigator. And one of the things that's hammered home when you're training in this field is make a list of every possible natural explanation and go through those first before you conclude that something is paranormal or supernatural. So I think that's actually a common principle that both uh, that both Caleb and I would agree with, and I suspect that John and uh, Darren would agree with, that natural explanations need to be considered, and they need to be considered first before you go to a more exotic interpretation of an event. Jimmy, I, I uh, know Joe Nickel. Uh, you may uh, oh, uh, yeah. know more. He's a paranormal investigator as well. Good guy. He wrote a chapter for me on the uh, Turin Shroud. Uh -huh. uh, but I heard him lecture too, and I remember uh, he, he, was, he was saying simply, I'm investigating these things, and sometimes I can c conclude some things, and other times I have to say I don't know. So uh, that also uh, is an option for you, right? I mean, sometimes you just have to say, uh, at what point do you cross over from the I don't know to it must be a miracle? I think, well, I think that it's going to depend on the framework that you're coming from. If you have, a, if you are genuinely open to the idea of the miraculous, to saying, to drawing the conclusion something's miraculous, and you've eliminated every other explanation, then you don't really have a reason holding you back from saying, okay, therefore it must be a miracle. Whereas if you, and Joe comes from, I, I appreciate Joe, I appreciate the work he does. I agree with him on, on quite a number of things, but Joe comes from a skeptical viewpoint of a type where he, Joe Nickel, where he wouldn't be comfortable saying to his skeptical audience, I mean, you know, he writes for the Skeptical Inquirer and so forth, saying, I encountered a real miracle. He's coming from a framework that kind of excludes the possibility of acknowledging something as a miracle. And so if he's eliminated every other possible explanation, he would tend to say, I don't know. Um, yeah. And so I think it really depends on, are you open to identifying something as a miracle or are you not open to identify and, and it like, as a miracle? And, like, and likewise with you, are mm -hmm. you open to the possibility that um, the evidence, if there were any evidence of a miracle uh, that you're investigating, if the, the evidence is no longer there or missing, or perhaps it got uh, run over by a truck or, you know, got thrown away yeah. in the trash. Are you open no. to the fact that there, yeah. Are you yeah, I'm, if, if, I, if I don't have, if someone says a miracle happened in the year 1503, but all the documentation has been lost, well, then I'm not going to conclude a miracle happened in the year 1503 because I don't have any, any basis for it. I would distinguish that from the case of the, um, of the virgin birth, where I mount a theological argument for the virgin birth. Um, but I wouldn't hold up the virgin birth to you and say, here's a bunch of non-theological evidence for it. The evidence I offer for it is theological. I acknowledge that right up front. So if you don't count theological evidence for one reason or another as actual evidence, I understand why you don't believe in it. I think that I think that, that doesn't affect the case I made if you if you don't look at the evidence I have to offer, but I understand why you why you would come to a different conclusion. Like I said in my opening slide, what you make of the virgin birth is going to depend on what perspective you're coming from. Uh, okay, I'd, I'd like to, uh, I know that we could probably go further on this, but I'd like to get to some more questions because we have had yeah. questions come in now. So uh, cool. let's get to some uh, some comments and questions from people. There was actually one uh, f 
for well there's a couple for jimmy but this one was sent in earlier from mr greeny he says uh what microphone <laughs> jimmy what microphone do you use and would you be willing to give darren one for christmas <laughs> Uh, it's an Audio Technica microphone, and um, if I don't have access to Darren Stocking, but um, I'm I, I I'm not prepared to say no at this point. I don't know how shipping works <laughs> with being this close to Christmas. I will say though that before we we went on air, I think John may need the new microphone because he was having some issues and he's on his phone now. So oh, I, I think if it's yeah. probably so. Yeah, he's actually using his phone, and his—I mean—that's the thing about phones is that they look great. So, like your your feed probably looks the best out of everyone's here, even though you're using your phone. Um, yeah. Let's move. Okay, so we did have a super chat come in from Drama Llama, uh, and this one is a clarifying question uh, for Jimmy. Did Jimmy say that miracles and other religions, such as Hinduism, could be true, or did I misunderstand what he said? Well, methodologically, I don't exclude um, a, 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 a miracle is a wonder. It's something that it that exceeds what you would expect from nature, and I don't. I, I, there's no reason to think that that miracles only occur in the context of Christianity. In fact, if you read the Bible, it talks about you know miracles occurring in other religious contexts. It may say they're they're lying wonders, they're lying miracles that are meant to mislead, but that doesn't mean they don't happen. Furthermore, I don't exclude the idea that God does mir the true God does miracles in other religions. He loves all of his children, and that includes all of us. So if someone in in India is sick and dying and praying to Shiva to be healed, well, I don't think Shiva is the true God, but God loves that person, and God may heal that person. And so, um, so I don't dismiss automatically miracles or other paranormal phenomena just because they're not occurring in a Christian context. Now, you know, the Jimmy. problem with that, you know, the problem with that, uh, Jimmy, is that if God does miracles for other religions, let's say Islam, uh, then uh, the people who receive those miracles will take it that Allah exists. And well, Allah they, does exist. No, he doesn't. Yeah, oh, yeah he religion. does. He Allah is just the Arabic word for God. They worship it, the creator of the God universe who appeared to Abraham. Worship which is that miracles equal validation yes. uh, in a lot of ways. And so that's, I think, what John's trying to get at. Yeah. Miracles. Yeah, I actually, mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jimmy, to finish your point. Well, miracles can be used for validation, either correctly or incorrectly, just like other things can be taken as validating. People can say, oh, God, if... Uh, if, if it's your will that I become an atheist, or I won't use that one because that would actually create a self-contradiction. If it's your will <laughs> that I, that I uh, become a janitor, let the sun come up tomorrow. And then the sun comes up tomorrow and someone says, ah, it's a sign. I've been validated. Yeah, but that's bad reasoning. So uh, miracles can, uh, you know, like any other phenomena can play a validating role in a in an accurate way and they can they people can draw erroneous conclusions from them so i was going to say to push back on that a little bit because i agree with some of that but that does kind of stick a thorn into the case i was making right in terms of that so in the presentation i was rushing through it towards the end there but i think the three main aspects i was looking at with the miracle claim are the quality of the evidence and i would say that generally speaking the evidence for Christian miracles and, and J. Lee's Marian claims are superior in terms of number of witnesses and documentation, medical stuff. And a lot of that is because the Western world simply has better documentation than in a lot of these countries like India and Sub-Saharan Africa. You're just not going to get proper documentation on like a medical level, unfortunately. So I, I, I understand there's a sampling bias there to an extent, but it is still a quality of evidence. And if God really, really wanted to vindicate another religion, I don't doubt that he could he could surpass that. So I would say quality is relevant in one way. And if you do have competing religious claims, I would my hypothesis would predict, and this is where I, I think it would be nice to get into models of prediction here, that if Christianity is true and you had competing miracles, that Christian miracles would win out. In other words, if a Christian Mary, a, a Christian missionary goes to India and there's an Indian guru. Um, that the Christian missionary, if, if they're healing, let's say they're Pentecostal, that that'll be more effective and draw more people to Christianity than it would be for the Hindu to draw people to to, uh, to Hinduism. So I do think there's also an element of conversion there and evangelism. And so miracles that are done primarily within groups that already believe it, if an, a guru is doing this for other Hindus who already accept it, I, I don't see that as really being vindication because it's, you know, why would God vindicate something that people already believe? I think that kind of vindication is something more 
for people who, who may not have the experiences of that. And God can provide healing through natural ways. He doesn't have to do it miraculously if that's his, if that's the main goal. He can also provide inter, inter feelings of peace and spirituality without having to do miracles. So I, I think the primary reason would be to do this wonder. And so mm-hmm. under that model, if you could find sufficiently attested uh, miracle claims in other religions that were comparable to that of Christianity, I think that would enter my hypothesis, and I'm willing to say that that would be a, a way to falsify it to an extent. Maybe Jimmy wouldn't agree with that. But. No, no, I agree with that. We're in agreement. Um, okay. The when I mean, this is not a new question, um, because in the ancient world, there were miracle reports in different religious contexts. And so um, how did the authors of the Bible handle that? Well, they compared the miracles. So when you have Moses sent to uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's ma- magicians duplicate the initial miracles that Moses does. And then Moses continues to perform other miracles that trump what the magicians of Pharaoh were able to do. And that provides evidence for Moses having the superior uh, religion in this case. In the same way, when later on in the Old Testament, when you have Elijah, Elijah versus the prophets of Baal, they have a miracle competition and to settle who is God. Is it Yahweh or is it Baal? And Elijah is able to produce, by invoking Yahweh, a more dramatic result than the prophets of Baal are able to. And so I agree, um, even though I don't exclude paranormal, supernatural, miraculous-looking things happening in other religions— we need to, if if we're in a situation of deciding between those religions, we need to see who's got the better the better miracles, and so, and if but, someone else besides Christianity had better miracles, that would provide evidence that they are the ones who were in contact with the with the with the philosophically provable creator. So I do need a, I do need to actually move us on to another question, um, John. I'm sure you've got other things that you'd like to say, but do you have something quick maybe that you could say? Yeah, yeah, I do. So do you believe that the pharaohs, the Egyptians, uh, the, the magicians, they actually threw down their staves and made those staves crawl uh, like and, and, and snakes? Do you, do you believe that miracle, that they actually did that miracle? I suspect that pharaohs, magicians used trickery. That's not what the text yeah. said. Um, the text can also be understood as giving a phenomenological report. Yeah, read it. I have read it. All right, all right. Let's uh, let's move on then. Let's let's move on to another question. Actually, you know what? Um, as I had the four of you up, let me put you all back up on the screen. I, I noticed um, to kind of break up the monotony. I, I wanted to uh, ask you a question, John. I noticed you've got a piano behind you. Um, <laughs> Can can you play the piano, or is that just a, a prop? No, that's uh, that's my wife's piano. She teaches piano lessons. Okay, my, uh, I was gonna. My s- instrument, my instrument is a guitar, and uh, I don't usually play that much. Okay, I was gonna say like it's 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 bad practice to like have something in your background that you don't actually play, especially I a should, musical I instrument. Should hide, I should hide everything in the background. <laughs> Meanwhile, Darren okay. should have a back of turtle swimming in his giant bookshelf. So, you know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> a lot of people have actually commented on uh, on Darren's uh, uh, aquarium back there saying that it's like it's actually pretty soothing. So, all right, let's uh, <laughs> let's move on to to another question. We, this one is from we actually have some really interesting questions. That's kind of why I, I want to push things along here. So from Ramana Driver question, if we shouldn't evaluate the mental health of historical figures, why do skeptics accuse Paul of hallucinating uh, without direct therapy records? That's a good question. I wish I would have asked that. I, I suppose this one is, is directed at maybe Darren. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no good historian would do that. Um, now, ca- it is true. Counter apologists do like to hypothesize these things. But we just simply don't have enough information to know the mental state of a lot of people. Um, And we have to recognize that when people in the ancient world did, in fact, if they were orally communicating something, they're trying to present themselves in a particular light. So it may not be giving us the full picture of them. And when people are writing about others, again, it's heavily prejudiced and biased and trying to get the reader, the audience, 
to come to a certain conclusion about people. So no, we shouldn't be making mental health claims as uh, anything more than just theorizing. Caleb, any thoughts? No, I mean, I think it's a good analogy to draw in terms of the, if you're going to posit Paul having a guilt complex and hypnopopic hallucination, you are essentially incorporating that retroactive approach like people like Gerd Ludemann or Richard Carrier might do. But, you know, Darren isn't, they're not a monolith. Darren doesn't have to agree with everything that every atheist historian has ever said. So uh, I think Darren's at least being consistent in his view in that way. So, yeah. Um, oh, okay, we have had a, a couple more super chats come in. We'll, we'll address these real quick. Uh, looks like this one is a little bit too big for my screen. Oh, well. Uh, the question is atheist debaters. If your sister had cancer that ate into her pelvis, which was attested to by doctors and scans, and then she went to Lourdes, pelvis regrown, uh, would or should you, what, what should you conclude? John, why don't we, uh, why don't we get your thoughts here? Well, I, I, uh, I wrote uh, an essay, What Would Convince Me? Um, you know, I'll link to that. Uh, you know, it would be, uh, abs we have to grant the uh, uh, hypothetical, uh, hypothetical. And I would have to say I um, am going to have to question my, um, my views. Um, but I'm not so sure that I could still adopt uh, the God that we find in the Bible. He's pretty barbaric. He accepted child sacrifice. You know, he was misogynistic. Um, and uh, he he required belief unto salvation or you would be punished eternally somehow for it, including the virgin birth of Mary, which has no evidence for it. So I, I still have trouble believing, but it would certainly um, cause me to question. But that's a hypothetical. It's not going to happen. I will say there are two accounts at Lourdes, uh, Delizia Soroli and I think uh, Dory McKelly, uh, who both had hip cancer that was healed. I actually I don't think those are the strongest cases, though, so I'm not even sure I would agree with the question there. But I don't I don't I don't know if they intentionally did that or if that just happens to be a coincidence that two of them worked that. All right, uh, moving on. This one, uh, another question for the atheists. Question to atheists: superiority to morals. Uh, don't, I'm not sure what that means. How will that be a deciding factor in individualistic? mindset prayers and blessings to all god bless us all um i'm gonna need your help uh anyone that can help me out interpreting this this question is he asking about, like morality being subjective or objective with spirit and morals I, I, it seems like it's sort of a tangential question to what the discussion was anyway yeah, that's that's true. It is it is sort of tangential. So, it, and that combined with the fact that it's a little bit difficult to interpret, we might just need to uh, to move on. I, I do appreciate you sending in uh, super chat, Francis, but um, it, it's it's just we, we we'll need to move on. All right, uh, this one another question. The atheists uh, are popular here with regards to miracles and legs growing out. Haven't all our legs grown out, quote unquote, or can biological life be explained purely on naturalistic grounds? Is this a like fish growing legs like evolution question? Is that what that's trying to imply? Yeah, um, I, I took well, it I mean, as I took it as all of us had legs grow out from the time we were a zygote, and so that would demonstrate it's possible for legs to grow out. And I guess that what Johannes may be getting at is then couldn't God do that too if someone's legs have been cut off? Well, um, we, we know we know he could we, because uh, we have um, examples of that in, uh, in octo octopi, uh, mm -hmm. octopuses, uh, and starfish and spiders. Uh, their legs will regrow themselves. And uh, I make an argument from that fact uh, that, um, well, then it would be easy for God to actually have our limbs regrow themselves if they got amputated. But uh, apparently what he does in the animal world, he doesn't do in, in, in us. Wow. He could, but he doesn't. John, hold on. The, but are you, so are you saying that if, if someone was prayed for and their leg grew back, like let's say you're praying over the name Jesus Christ, leg instantly grew out and they were amputated and you could verify that. Would you then say, oh, that's interesting. Or would you say, well, <laughs> Lizards can grow tails back, people. I mean, the fact that you have enough amputees, you're bound to get at least one through some weird circumstance well, that grows a leg out. The coincidence of prayer. I mean, like, well, I'm, I'm generally asking, what would your reaction be? Because I, I can't well, tell. Well, you precluded to. The thing about that is that if that's how the world was created to be by a creator God, 
we wouldn't know any different. We simply wouldn't know any different. They just naturally regrow. And perhaps there might be some, some kind of biological reason for it, like you find in octopuses and spiders and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, starfish. So uh, no, I wouldn't think much of it if it actually was that case. And it, it would be a better world, too. If the only case that happened was when it happened immediately after someone praying for them in the name of Jesus, would that do anything in terms of relevance? Or are you saying we just can't draw that analogy? Well, I, I'd say exactly I'd say the same thing I said earlier about if I saw a miracle. I mean, it caused me to to question, but uh, I could I still couldn't would have a hard time believing in that kind of God and the barbaric one actually in the Bible. So if the leg if the leg comes back and on the leg there's a tattoo that says, "Hello, John, believe in me." Sign well, Jesus Christ. I have a whole I have a whole essay. I'm trying to, push you this, I'm trying to get. I'm just trying to, to push you to see how, how much it would do. But. I have a whole essay on what would convince me, and yes, I can be convinced. But God, okay. can, but okay. in order in order to do that, my conclusion is that history would have to be changed. We have a we have a barbaric Bible. We have a, a Bible that requires belief, even though you 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 don't have evidence. That we have a, a, a history of violence in the church which god could have had a different revelation and uh condemned it from the get-go and what he didn't condemn he could have uh stop it uh by simply taking a criminal or would-be criminal and putting them in jail some kind of jail somewhere that's what we do but no he lets them run free so uh, i i would have still have a hard time believing in god but i would certainly question okay Okay, let's move on. Uh, we've got another super chat that was sent in, and I think this might be our last one just because we've gone uh, about two and a half hours at this point, and that's about how much time we budgeted. So uh, Addison Weir says, how do the atheists distinguish between a God of the gaps argument and a successful argument for theism that they can't answer? Again, this one might be a little bit tangential, um, so feel free to... Uh, we don't have to really address this too too in depth, but uh, if either of you have any thoughts, feel free to share. You know, um, some time ago I had seen a meme and it said something like, um, if God is all powerful, no, if God is all knowing, then he should know what it would take to convince me. And if God is all powerful, he should be able to do it. And if God is all loving, then he should want to convince me. Um, and I remember that resonating with me so much because it isn't this, no, nope, you have a moving of the goalposts or anything like that. It's, I have made it fairly clear to God, myself and others. These are the things that would convince me. And it should be really easy for God to do, but he comes up short every time because, and now I'm left with the explanation. Why doesn't he do it versus uh, why he would to somebody else? And the best explanation for me, at least, is that he just doesn't exist. Uh, otherwise, we have a God that, you know, is criminal, is maniacal, is hyper selective in who he favors and yeah. loves. So just to respond to that, um, I understand, you know, John and Darren, that y'all have a particular understanding of God that as being cruel and barbaric and things like that. And this understanding has a history in Christianity. It is not universal among Christians. And so the question that that you posed Aaron about well if god why doesn't god if he loves me why doesn't he why doesn't he tell me or show me what i need in order to believe and if i don't i'm going to go to hell well that's essentially a subcase of the problem of evil it's specifically an intellectual version of the problem of evil why don't i have the evil is being deprived of this evidence that would convince me and so the solutions that apply to the problem of evil in general also apply here. Um, you know, we don't have time because of how late it is right now to go through them. But in principle, I would just quickly say that God would not allow this evil unless he was going to bring a greater good out of it. And God will not hold you accountable for things that are not your fault. So if, if you're not a believer through no fault of your own, he's not going to hold you accountable for things that are not your fault. That's a different understanding than the fundamentalist conception of God that says, 
absolutely everyone who's not an explicit Christian is going to burn in hell, but it is a position that's common among Christians, including among Catholics. It's actually the official teaching of the Catholic Church. So if you're ever thinking about religious options, you might consider that. I'd also just say that I believe uh, if they wanted to plug it in, John has an anthology on Problem of Evil, and I know Darren has an essay in that about uh, mysotheism, right? So you know, maybe they just want to point to that in response. <laughs> It's uh, the title of it is God and Horrendous Suffering. All right, let's do this. Let's move to some closing statements. And uh, I think I've got a way that we can uh, we can do this quickly because we have been going for, for quite a while now. So I want to pick yeah. a representative from each group to uh, to give a closing statement. And I think we should go with the people that are on the thumbnail. So Jimmy, you can be the Christian representative. And then John, you can be the atheist representative. And just share some closing thoughts. I mean, this is, this is going to be off the cuff. I didn't ask you guys to prepare any closing remarks or anything. So feel free to summarize your thoughts so far uh, about the debate and then just any, any closing thoughts. Uh, and take about, if you can, about two minutes. We'll try to keep it short. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's start with Jimmy though. Okay. Well, I, uh, I'm pleased that, you know, over the course of the debate, even though we had a somewhat rocky start, we've been able to at least achieve a com- discovery of some common ground on, on a number of issues. We're not as far apart as it might have appeared at the beginning of the debate, but we do have differences. Um, I understand the concerns, for example, that uh, John raised regarding the virgin birth, and I think those have answers. Unfortunately, we don't have time for them. Um, you know, we haven't had time for them, and we've had a vigorous discussion on a variety of different points. But, you know, he's written other things about them. I've written other things about the same topics, and I'd suggest that people check out both of what we've written, either on his website, Debunking Christianity, or at my website, jimmyakin.com. Um, When it comes to the argument that I presented for the virgin birth, it is a logically valid argument, and therefore the only way for its conclusion that the virgin birth is true to not be true is for one or more of the premises to be uh, false. And I I, I, unfortunately, I don't think that, uh, that John showed that any of the premises are false. He could easily say, well, I didn't have time to, or I didn't have enough time to consider the argument in depth. And I understand all those things. Debates are never conclusive, but I he, he wanted to debate this topic. It wasn't my preferred topic, but I was happy to say, well, here's why I believe in the virgin birth in a logically rigorous form, so that that would at least provide us with some kind of framework as opposed to, you know, mentioning various other issues. All right, let's turn to, it looks like Caleb just completely abandoned us. No, <laughs> I'm sure uh, he'll be let's... back. He just had to step away, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we have been going a while, so he he uh, he may have just stepped out for a second. All right, let's, uh, let's go to, there he is. Caleb is back. Uh, John, yeah, feel free to, to share your closing thoughts. Yeah, uh, Cameron, I'm, I'm happy and thankful that you, uh, you had us on. I appreciate that. Uh, being able to spar with some pretty good, uh, witty and knowledgeable uh, you know, Christian apologists. I think all apologi- all apologists are a special pleading, begging the question, um, doing the best they can, because a lot of what we find in the Bible, not all, but a lot, is just simply myth reworked and re- regurgitated and rewritten uh, from uh, previous um, myths to, to make them look uh, palatable to the uh, the people of their day and changing their views along the way. And um, there's really not much to it except the, the damage it has done over the years. It has done some good too, but I think uh, the, uh, the, the bad things outweigh the good uh, for no other reason. It allows people to believe things that, that don't have good evidence. I say solid evidence for, but but um, uh, I, I, I want everyone to simply do some further re- research. You know, go to Jimmy's site, you know, and uh, look what he, look what he has there to say. And then come over to my site afterward for a rebuttal. Thank you so much. 
All right. Well, uh, last thing to say is just uh, thank you guys for for spending your your evening with me. Thank you for preparing. This has been uh, a couple months at least in in uh, preparing for this, and so uh, really appreciate you taking the time to put your presentations together and and again just the hours spent here with me and and talking about this uh, this really interesting and important issue. I mean, I don't even know like maybe Caleb or, or I don't know if, if anyone knows of any other debates, like I don't know of any uh, debates on this topic at this depth. So I think this might be a first. I don't know. Yeah. Which is why you should subscribe and hit that like button for caption Christianity. If you want more exclusive content, <laughs> right? Just run that plug in there for you. There oh, you go. And I just, I, 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 I just I want to wish uh, everybody a, uh, a Merry Christmas. In other words, happy celebration of the Virgin birth and to our atheist friends, a most sincere, have a great day. <laughs> yeah. Our thoughts are with you, atheists out there watching. And, and the, well, I, the I like the celebrations. I like the presents and, the, and the, the holidays. You get to go out to eat, to eat a few more times and see people. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Christmas is a great time. Christmas. Uh, well, thank you. No, for, for real. Thank you guys for, for joining me. Thank you for watching. Yeah. Subscribe if you'd like to support the channel. Uh, feel free to become a patron links to that are in the description. You also get cool things and perks in, in return and everything, but, uh, yeah, really appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks to our debaters one last time. See you guys in the next video. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now, and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?